Hello, uh, can everybody hear me? All right, I got at least one thumbs up that I could see, fantastic. I'm uh, really impressed we have 40 people here for this very first uh, tutorial we've ever had at SPA. So I'd like to uh, just say a few words of thanks before I hand it over to Yan Gu, who has uh, been doing a fantastic job of creating this, uh, this tutorial and workshop session this year. Um, so there are just two things I'd like to say. The first of them is a reminder that we are in this brave new world of online conferences here, and we're asking you to have a huge cognitive overload. We're asking you to have Slack open, we're asking you to have Zoom open, and then when you take a break, we're asking you to have Gather open so that you can chat online with other people. If you find all of this overwhelming, um, you know, feel free to ask uh, Roberto or Jan or me for some assistance. Uh, we'll all be happy to help you with any technical issues. And, uh, and other than that, uh, the other thing I wanted to say is I'm pretty sure if you look through everyone who's here, um, one of the participants in this workshop right now is Vijaya. And Vijaya is our safe talk representative. Uh, that's the safe theory of computing. It's a, a new organization that's trying to help make sure that we're building the right inclusive community within the theory of computing research area. And so if anybody finds at any point that there's something that's making them uncomfortable, um, I certainly invite you to either get in touch with me or her and we will try and reconcile uh, the situation as quickly as we can and help you out. Um, with all of that said, again, thank you so much for being here. And uh, Jan, I believe, is going to take over from here. So I'm going to mute and unvideo myself and let him take over. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining today. Uh, we're going to have our first uh, tutorial in SPA. And actually, today we have two very cool tutorials. The first one is will start now. Uh, it will be about research and teaching with OpenSilk. It will, it will be done by Dorothy, Angelina, Alex, Charles, and TB. It will start in a minute. and. At 4 p.m. Eastern time today, we'll have the next one, uh, Implementing Parallel Tree Structure in Shared Memory, uh, which will be given by Yi Han. And before we start, I, spend, I will spend one minute in introducing how we're going to interact. First, how to pose a question. You can pose a question at any time. Uh, it will be done in the SPA 2020 Slack channel. Uh, and go to the channels, you see tutorials, open silk, and you can talk to them and coordinator during the first half of the talk. Um, sorry, everyone will be muted, but if you have any questions, you can post it here. And if you have not, if you don't know how to uh, access the Slack channel, uh, I think everyone here has been registered because otherwise you don't have the Zoom link, but you, will, you should receive this SPA 2020 presentation and conference logistic. If you roll down, you'll see a red, uh, invitation here. And I think in, in many cases, you will receive another registration link as well, but any of them will work. You just click and you can go to the, the Slack channel for SPA 2020. And lastly, the presentation will be recorded uh, and it will be on the SPA 2020 uh, channel, uh, uh, YouTube channel later. And if you don't want to be uh, recorded, you, you can just turn off the video and stay, sorry stay muted during the Q&A and uh, yeah, I guess that's it. Uh, so now I'll pass to Dorothy and then I will start our first uh, tutorial on OpenSilk. Let me break in before Dorothy starts. Uh, hi everybody, my name is Roberto Bormieri. I am helping getting all these tools together and uh, make sure that everything goes smooth or goes. Um, uh, there is a Slack channel on technical support uh, or you can write me directly uh, in case you have any issue by, of anything or if you know that somebody else is trying to join the conference is having problems, please write me. I'll try to be as quick as possible. Um, to handle any any problem that, that can come up. Yeah, sorry again, Dorothy. Oh. 
Okay, and now, um, slideshow. Okay, so I think I got unmuted and everything's okay. Uh, and we'll start with the same information you've been seeing for a while, but this is being recorded. And uh, we hope we hope you can deal with that. Uh, and the slides are available online. Okay, so we're going to start. Uh, welcome to the uh, SPA tutorial, Research and Teaching with Open Silk. Uh, thank you all for attending. Um, my name is Dorothy Curtis. I'm first here just because of the alphabet. And uh, most of the other people have done all the work. Uh, okay, so we have Alex here and Angelina and Charles Lyserson and TB Shardle. Um, okay, and you can email us at contact at opensilk.org. Our website is a little out of date, so uh, but it's there. Um, and with this, I will be turning it over to Charles. I will I will still be running this the slides, but uh, we're gonna go, this is his slide, okay. Okay, welcome everybody. Um, it's a, I'm delighted to be able to talk about uh, Open Silk uh, today. And um, uh, I'd like to, um, start by just doing a little uh, poll. When we created um, Open Silk, we realized there were two classes of researchers that were using Silk. Uh, one we called Eagles, which are researchers who employ large amounts of parallel computing and supported their scientific interests. And the other are Owls, which are researchers who are developing parallel computing technology usually to address the future needs of eagles. So typically there are way many more eagles than owls and most computer systems for parallel computing therefore uh, address the concerns of eagles. Um, often the owls technology is kind of do it yourself at home uh, things and Silk is unique in being the only parallel computing platform that has been shown to effectively serve both the eagles and the owls. So you can make modifications to it and so forth. So um, I'd like to do a little poll here. Uh, so Roberto, if you can uh, send out our poll. Uh, some people are eagle owls, which is actually a creature. But what I'd like to do is if you do, if you're more of an eagle or more of an owl, can you uh, vote here in the poll and let us know um, uh, whether you consider yourself to be more of an uh, eagle or more of an owl. Okay, somebody who develops the technology or somebody who uses the technology. I'm sorry, I don't know how to vote. Um, because you're a co-host, Michael, uh, you cannot vote. Exactly. We discovered. <laughs> so you can only watch it in progress. But we know who you are, Mike. No. Okay, we still have a few people voting. Okay, 77% have voted. Um, so if you consider yourself to be, to do more uh, research on developing the technology, you're an owl. If you consider yourself to be using the technology in order to compute good things, you're an eagle. We got 85. Maybe we can get up to 90 and then we'll close the poll. Um, just a couple. It looks people. like 100 to me. We got 31 of 35. There are a couple of people who maybe are, are neither, and maybe that's what's going on. We didn't put a neither. We, Side men. Okay, uh, so that looks good. So why don't we uh, close the poll here and share the results. And so it looks like we've got slightly, uh, we got about 60, 40 or so owls to eagles, which is not the mix that you normally would get. And 
for if you were talking to people generally about parallel computing, not too surprising for this community uh, that uh, that we have um, a lot of of both. Well, um, Open Silk was designed to address uh, the needs of both, but in particular to address the needs of owls. Uh, while still satisfying the needs of eagles, because there are a lot of platforms out there that eagles can use, okay, whether it be OpenMP or TVB or uh, UPC or any of a variety of things that really are not designed to be dealt with under the covers. But we're trying to do something that deals with both. So next slide, please. Okay, and we can close the poll. Um, now, uh, Silk has had an outsized impact compared to its use. Uh, if you look at Google Scholar, it's had um, over 9,000 citations for, for Silk. And uh, the runtime system and the language and the Silk scheduler have, have a huge amount of things. It's really used. Uh, in the last couple of years, um, I didn't go back further than that. You know, I, I looked to see who had used Silk in a way that meaning, where they meaningfully rely on Silk. In other words, I didn't just want the papers that, that um, mentioned Silk. I wanted ones where they actually used Silk in the production of the results for the paper. And I found it was not focused on just a single conference. It was really quite broad. And there have been a lot of universities that have used Silk in their courses. Um, and so this uh, uh, is an important technology uh, to use going forward. And so it was very disappointing two years ago to hear that Intel, which had provided the main uh, Silk uh, uh, system, uh, had decided to deprecate Silk. Um, Next slide, please. So, um, so here's a brief history. Uh, we formed the Silk Project at MIT uh, in the, um, uh, what is that, about 25 years ago uh, to about 15 years ago, uh, offering a simple multi-thread programming combined with execution efficiency. And in 2006, we spun Silk Arts out of MIT uh, and provided support for C++ and parallel root loops and introduced reducer hyperobjects. In 2009, uh, we sold the company to Intel because in the fall of 2008, uh, the economy went completely sour and we were faced with the decision uh, after things had looked so bright in the summer of 2008 with uh, the economy in meltdown and either uh, laying off everybody and going into hibernation or hoping that um, somebody would be able to use the technology productively. And so we, um, uh, we sold it to Intel um, and uh, they uh, repackaged Silk++, Plus Plus, uh, implemented a new uh, runtime, put it into their compiler and um, it uh, offered um, uh, vector operations and uh, in addition to the basic capabilities of Silk++. Plus Plus. Now, um, uh, things went reasonably well for a few years at Intel, for about five years, um, you know, adding and developing it, but uh, Intel was unable to retain uh, the uh, members of the Silk team. At this point, I think there's only one Silk Arts person still at Intel. And um, because they lost all their Silk people, um, the development of Silk Plus stagnated. They produced no new capabilities. They integrated it no way. And some of the integration that had been done, they no longer were consistent in making sure, for example, that tools worked with, um, uh, worked with the run times and worked with the new compilers. And so in 2017, they announced that they were dropping support for Intel Silk Plus, and they had also put it into GCC, and GCC very quickly said, okay, well, if you're not gonna maintain it, we're not gonna include it. 
and so they followed suit. And so what happened after that was I had a lot of people express um, disappointment about the loss of this technology, especially for the research community and teaching community. And so uh, I went out and secured uh, funding from the National Science Foundation and the Air Force to fund development of open silk. And last Friday, uh, we released the first public uh, beta, uh, which is beta two. We actually had a beta earlier in the, um, in the year in, in uh, late spring, uh, but we only released that to kind of uh, friends as we sorted out licensing terms and such. So, um, so I'm really happy. Last Friday, we released Open Silk 1.0 beta, and that's what we're going to talk about and give you folks a chance to try out uh, today. Next slide. Um, the system architecture Open Silk uh, was designed uh, with a bunch of things in mind that mattered for researchers and teachers. Okay. Uh, we wanted to, first of all, make it be compatible so that we could get all the people, rescue all the people who are on the deprecated Silk Plus uh, platform. Uh, we're not supporting their vector operations. Um, there are a lot of issues with their vector operations, and maybe vectors and GPUs is something for the future. But right now, uh, we just go after the task parallel aspects of, of, um, uh, for compatibility. Um, we uh, have everything open source, and it's under a very liberal open source licenses, like the MIT license and the LLVM license, which is uh, like Apache 2.0. Um, so these uh, licenses, um, uh, in comparison, Intel did release some things under open, um, open source, but their own compiler was closed. And they did put it in GCC, but GCC was never as good as their own ICC compiler or ICPC even. Um, uh, they also, um, all the tools were closed source. So, um, so our intention is that everything be open source, okay? Uh, another thing is that uh, we wanted to componentize things, to divide the system into distinct software components with well-defined interfaces. We would like everything to have an API so that people can plug and play with the components. So if you want to use the compiler, but you're not interested in the runtime, you can do that. Or if you want to use the runtime, but you're not interested in the compiler, you can do that. Or you want to compile from a different language, but use the same runtime, you can do that. You want to plug a new scheduler in to the runtime system, you can do that. Okay, you want to build your own tool, okay, that uses um, uh, uh, the um, technology. We want to make it so that uh, so that the instrumentation is componentized. So you can use compiler instrumentation without having to become an LLVM expert, for example. So that was very important uh, part of the design. We want to make this be something that the community can use. Um, we're very concerned about integration because this is one of the things that as things stagnated for Silk Plus at uh, Intel, uh, the individual components uh, you know, were enhanced sometimes, uh, but they wouldn't necessarily interrupt with other parts. And so you would find things like the scalability analyzer, the race detector no longer worked when they had a new compiler release. And nobody was concerned that those things didn't interoperate because they never considered it as a single technology that yeah, Intel, all the responsibilities for the different components, the compiler, the runtime, the tools, all distributed across different parts of their um, company. And finally, uh, we wanted to make it be reliable. We wanted a suite of extensive tests and benchmarks to ensure that releases are stable, perform well, and are free of serious bugs. So those were sort of our five main uh, architectural uh, concerns. Next slide. Um, so this tutorial is uh, focuses on researchers and educators who already know something about silk. I'm not going to teach the silk language at this tutorial. Okay, uh, this is um, 
If you want to learn about it, there's a lot of online stuff that you can find, and we will be offering such tutorials. But what I was interested in doing for this is for people, for example, in particular, who have codes that they have run in uh, Silk Plus to allow them to migrate to OpenSilk um, as easily as possible. And during the hands-on session will be the latter half of this tutorial, uh, you can download and install from binary uh, our beta release. And if you want to get a jump on things, since downloading for some people may take um, some time, it really only takes a few minutes, but you may want to get going on it already, uh, you can um, uh, you know, put this, and uh, I believe there is a link in the Slack and if not, perhaps um, somebody should put a uh, link in the Slack so you can just click on it. Um, it's in the Slack. But it's in the Slack, I believe. Thank you. Uh, we have a bunch of um, technical support assistants who are ready to hold your hand as you experiment with the release, including getting your Silk Plus Plus and Silk Plus codes to work. And uh, you can also schedule additional technical support for some time in the future. So if you feel you want to try this and you want to, but you want more time to do it, don't worry about it being over. We can schedule something uh, for tutorial attendees. We can afford, uh, since there are um, less than 50 participants on the, on the uh, call here, I think we can afford to handhold um, a, a, a significant number of them. Part of our, our goal here is to, you know, hopefully you don't need much hand holding, but, um, but we'll see. That's, that's part of the, the, um, the excitement and the danger of doing things live uh, is uh, we'll see if there are problems or not. Next. Okay. Yep. okay. So the outline for this is I'm going to run over the um, open silk um, organization uh, briefly to tell you a little bit about how we've organized ourselves through this. This is an organization that is, needs a lot of work. We are really just uh, struggling to, to get going. And I'll talk a little bit about how that works. And then I will um, turn things over to uh, T.B. Shardle, who is the chief architect uh, of Open Silk and deserves uh, the lion's share of credit for us having an open silk uh, 1.0 beta release uh, because he's uh, also the um, compiler architect uh, and he will work with uh, Angelina Lee who is uh, the uh, runtime architect and um, also uh, Alex uh, Iliopoulos uh, will talk about the, the tools. Um, and so we'll give you an overview of what's in uh, this, um, uh, this package. And then we'll turn to uh, plans uh, for what's coming up, what the releases are that are coming up, and Q&A. And then we'll have a short break, and uh, then we will have our hand-holding, hands-on session. Uh, part of that will be demos. So if, you're, um, if you don't really want to try to um, do the hands-on, you may still find it worthwhile uh, to watch the demo, and once again, TB will run that part of it. So mostly, I'm just the front person, and TB is the um, is the uh, is the star uh, with uh, an able co-star in Angelina and a little bit of Alex. Uh, and Dorothy is our producer. Uh, okay, let's uh, next. So the Open Silk Organization, next. So our mission is to provide quality open source parallel programming software and responsive support services for the benefit of application developers, parallel language researchers, and teachers of, comp of parallel computing. Currently, OpenSilk operates under the auspices of MIT. So we made a decision that rather than trying to set up our own um, uh, uh, what is it, 401C3 or whatever it is, organization, uh, we were going to simply operate under MIT and thereby allow us to avail ourselves of MIT's legal support and all of the stuff that they can provide. However, our longer term goal 
is to spin this off and have it be more uh, independent. Um, the, there are some downsides as we've discovered in things like licensing uh, of having it under MIT, but we've managed to um, confront those hurdles. Um, and we don't want this to be an MIT project, even though it is very, right now, very much you know, run outside, out of MIT and such. Next. Um, the leadership of the team is, uh, as I mentioned, uh, TB is the chief architect, and um, Angelina Lee is the runtime architect. Uh, we've been very fortunate to uh, get John Carr, who is um, our, uh, besides TB and Angelina, our main um, uh, work Course on uh, getting this. John uh, actually was a um, work at Silk Arts uh, when we had that company. He then moved to Intel and he worked there. Then he went off and did some, some several things of, uh, of unimportance to this audience and now has returned to, um, to work on this. So we're really fortunate to have somebody who is as educated about Silk to be a programmer. Let me just mention that we are also interested in programmers and in other roles. Uh, the degree to which those can be volunteer is better, but uh, we actually have uh, money from NSF and Air Force to hire uh, people to make things uh, work. Uh, Dorothy Curtis has been our project manager. She's kind of our VP of engineering, uh, but we don't quite have a role of VP of engineering because they're not a company. And uh, I get to stand up in front and, and uh, extol the virtues of all the people who've actually do the work on this. Uh, there's many other contributors here, the principal ones, uh, Alex, who's a postdoc, Tim, uh, Matthew, Billy, Kyle, uh, Daniela, although he has moved to Google, and Grace, who worked on this during her master's thesis work and um, then did a, the nice transition to uh, being a, um, uh, uh, providing us with summer uh, help post-graduation. Next. Uh, one of the things that we realized was that it was very important to have community input. And so we have um, organized the development activities through a, um, to have them reviewed by the Open Silk Advisory Board. Uh, I'm really pleased that Vivek Sarkar of Georgia Tech has agreed to chair that board uh, with um, John Gilbert and Lawrence uh, Rauschberger from, um, to be uh, co-chairs. Uh, and most of the, the um, interactions with uh, the members go through that leadership so that there's a way of sort of focusing, you know, what we're hearing and getting in talk. Here are the members of it. As you can see, it's a large um, list. Um, I did not really um, try to minimize the number of people on the advisory board because I think we need a lot of advice from top people. And, uh, and these are all people who have uh, one way or another uh, had a, um, have a lot of knowledge, et cetera. And, and I think we can benefit from their uh, expertise and experience. Um, next. So now I'd like to turn things over uh, to um, to TB. All yours, TB. Can everyone hear me? Mm -hmm. All right, great. Uh, yeah, thank you for uh, welcome to SPA. Welcome to the very first SPA tutorial. I guess it's now my turn to welcome everybody. Um, <laughs> Uh, I now like to talk a little bit about uh, what's actually in OpenSilk 1.0 Beta 2, and I'll be doing uh, I'll be presenting this with help from uh, Angelina and Alexandros, as Charles previously mentioned. So at a high level, the uh, the open the Beta 2 release of OpenSilk uh, contains several open source components. We have the compiler, which is based on LLVM, but more specifically based on Taper LLVM. Uh, we have a runtime system, which is based on Cheetah, which is uh, a runtime a Silk runtime system uh, developed at Washington University in St. Louis by Angelina Lee. Uh, we have some open source compiler-based tools, including a 
Determinacy Race Detector called SilkSan, and a Scalability Analyzer called SilkScale. Uh, we have a suite of regression tests as well as some benchmark uh, codes. Uh, and right now we have support for reducers, but that's in the form of Intel Silk Plus's, uh, Intel's Silk Plus reducer library. Uh, OpenSilk Beta 2 features uh, a few task parallel features. There is full support for exceptions. Um, currently no support for vector extensions. This is uh, the vector extensions from Intel Silk Plus that Charles previously mentioned. Uh, and that's our intent, that we're not going to be uh, supporting those vector extensions uh, in OpenSilk. Um, there's currently no support for pedigrees or deterministic uh, parallel pseudo-random number generation, uh, but that is a feature on our radar and we are working to, uh, uh, we plan to add support for pedigrees in the future. Among the other task parallel features, uh, something that I'll talk a little bit more about later uh, is the ability to spawn more than just function calls, but in fact, uh, statement blocks. And we'll see what that looks like in a couple of slides. Uh, next slide, please. So currently we have tested, uh, we have developed OpenSilk Beta 2 uh, for Unix and Linux-like systems on x86-64 processors. Uh, we have tested these, uh, we have tested OpenSilk on several different operating systems, including Ubuntu 18.04, FreeBSD 12.1, Fedora 30, and Mac OS X 10.15. Um, there have been, there's been some amount of testing on a few other systems, but those are the main ones we've looked at thus far. If you want to try OpenSilk on a different uh, Unix or Linux based x86-64 x86 system, uh, you're welcome to give it a try. Uh, we are not sure exactly uh, how broad is the set of systems that we support. Um, so it may work on other distributions. Uh, come and talk to us. All right, so now I want to dive into some of the individual components. And I'll start by talking about the OpenSilk compiler. So the OpenSilk compiler is based on the uh, award-winning Taper LLVM compiler. This was a compiler uh, published at PPOP 2017 and where it won the uh, best paper award at that conference. Uh, long story short, if you're gonna use the OpenSilk compiler, what does that mean from the user's perspective? You're gonna compile your Silk programs using Clang and you want to use the flag dash F OpenSilk. So as shown on the slide, you can compile uh, a program using Clang and F OpenSilk and then just run the executable and you should be running uh, using Silk. And we'll see more of this uh, later on during the hands-on demo part of the presentation. Uh, the OpenSilk compiler, like I said, is based on Taper LVM. Uh, Taper LVM has the remarkable feature that it optimizes Silk programs more effectively than traditional uh, Silk compilers, such as GCC and ICC. And on top of that, uh, the OpenSilk compiler has uh, added bug fixes and various performance improvements over the original Taper LLVM compiler. So that just frames where the OpenSilk compiler stands with respect to uh, previous research work on Taper LLVM. Here's a brief summary of the compiler features. It's based on Taper LLVM, meaning that it's also based on Clang and LLVM. And for the beta two release of OpenSilk, we're specifically based on Clang and LLVM version nine. The OpenSilk compiler supports the uh, standard Silk keyword, Silk Spawn, Silk Sync, and Silk 4. You should be able to use those in both C and C++ programs. In addition, OpenSilk supports uh, Silk Spawn statements of more than just ordinary function calls. For example, you could write, uh, as shown on the side, Silk Spawn of X plus equals Y. Doesn't have to be a statement that's quite so simple. You can have more complex compound statements. You could spawn a loop that's in your code. If you just want that loop to run in parallel with everything else, you could spawn a spawn, you could spawn a silk for loop. Uh, there are all kinds of things that you can do with spawning of these statements. And the OpenSilk compiler works with standard Clang flags, including the uh, optimization flags inside of Clang and traditional debugging flags. Uh, 
if you encounter any issues when trying to use the open source compiler and one of those flags, uh, you should let us know that that is, that, that is an issue you encountered because at least the intent is that it works with all of those flags. Uh, current status of the compiler, it's been tested on a wide variety of Silk applications, ranging from the Silk 5 applications, uh, the problem-based benchmark suite out of CMU, uh, some Intel example codes, uh, the LIGRA lightweight graph processing framework, uh, that's worked by Julian Shun, uh, and many other codes. Uh, and moreover, at least for C code, earlier versions of the compiler have been uh, used in various classes. And uh, by virtue of that, uh, the earlier versions of the compiler have been battle tested by hundreds of undergraduate and graduate students at MIT, Washington University in St. Louis, and CMU. So now I'd like to turn it over to uh, Angelina Lee, who will talk about the open source runtime system. Uh, thanks, CB. Hi, uh, can everybody hear me? Nope. Okay, great. So uh, I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about the current status of the runtime. Um, the origin of the runtime system is not as glamorous as TB's taper system. Um, I actually started to develop this runtime because I'm teaching a graduate level parallel computing course and I really wanted a simple runtime that I can, you know, throw at students and have them modify and play with different synchronization protocols and that's where Cheetah came from. Uh, so I developed this Cheetah runtime uh, for teaching this class at Washington University. And that ended up becoming the basis for open silk runtime system. And so the the goal is to have a simple, easy to extend, easy to mod modify, and high performing work stealing runtime system. Um, currently, the scheduler supports Silk Spawn, Silk Sync, uh, Silk 4, exceptions, and reducer hyper objects. Um, I would say, uh, even though I'm the main architect of the runtime, uh, we have had a lot of help, and you know, uh, Matthew, John, Grace, TB, uh, and various other people on the team all sort of contribute to it. Um, the status of the runtime is that, well, so as I said, the goal is to make it simple, easy to extend and modify. And uh, right now, the number of lines of code in the runtime is less than 5,000, uh, even though that sounds like quite a bit, but this actually includes a substantial amount of comments and core header files. And comparing to the original runtime from Silk Plus is much smaller and much meaner because Silk Plus was 22,000 plus lines of code. Uh, we're still doing a bit of performance engineering on it. Um, when you run an application with ample parallelism, you don't really see any performance difference comparing to Intel Silk Plus. However, if your application has limited parallelism, then you might see the performance slightly lag behind uh, Intel Silk Plus, which is something that we hope to address in the very near future. Uh, next, please. Uh, in addition, the runtime system also support reducer hyper objects, uh, which is an object-based reduction mechanism that's supported you know, since Silk Plus. Uh, currently, we are basically reusing the Silk Plus Reducer library from Intel. So it provides exactly the same linguistic interface as what it was in Silk Plus. Um, the runtime backend support for Reducer, we use a more efficient Reducer data structure. Uh, it's called the Sparse Accumulator, if you're familiar with it. And if you're not, don't worry about it. Um, we are still doing some performance engineering on it. And currently there's a hard limit, uh, although a pretty high limit on the active number, sorry, the number of active reducers you can have in your code. And again, this is a limitation that we hope to remove fairly quickly uh, in the near future. Um, and we have some other idea as to what kind of future extension we wanna do both in the runtime and the reducer, which we'll talk about later during the presentation. Um, so uh, from now on, I'm going to hand it up to Alex uh, for him to talk about the tools. Thank you, Angelina. Uh, welcome everybody from me as well. And thank you also to Charles and TB and Dorothy for uh, introductions. 
I will briefly talk about uh, two tools that are included in the OpenSilk 1.0 beta 2 release. The first one of which is the Silk Sunrays detector. This tool is an open source replacement for the Silk Screen Brace detector by Intel, which was closed source. And what it offers is a way to do basic determinacy race detection on memory accesses, which in a nutshell is a way to find bugs that uh, might cause uh, programs to behave non-deterministically when executed in parallel. And the way that Silksum achieves this is uh, via compiler instrumentation to implement the SP bags algorithm within the serial execution of the, of the program that is being tested and sand test. So far, the Silk Sun Race Detector has been tested in its current version on about 20 Silk applications and does not yet include any special support for uh, accesses via locks and reducer hyper objects. And uh, as part of uh, the, the classes on Silk programming that TB mentioned earlier, earlier versions of uh, Silk Sun have been battle tested by hundreds of students uh, doing Silk programming as part of their coursework. Next slide, please. So here's a brief example of what the output looks like when uh, when someone is using Silk Sun, and this is something that you will that you will see in more detail uh, during the hands-on session later. Uh, in the bottom left, I have a small snippet from a from parallel C code to calculate the number of uh, configurations of uh, putting n queens on an n by n chessboard such that they cannot attack each other directly. Uh, we can use Silk Sun to find logically parallel accesses to the same location, at least one of which involves a write. And in doing that, since it's done the instrumentation, this introduces some uh, additional overhead, but it's, uh, it's proven that the analysis cost is proportional to serial execution. And in this particular example, that means that uh, running with Silk Sun has an overhead of about a 7x factor over serial execution. Now, once the code is... Uh, is compiled with, uh, with Silk Sun and Run. Then Silk Sun outputs uh, some uh, diagnostic information, such as what you see on the right. So, first, it, uh, it alerts us that you know, it has detected a race, in this case, this right access to the, the B array on the left. Uh, this race because of the context in which uh, B sits in, and then B is passed on to A when uh, the Silk Spawn is, uh, is called later. And we see some specific diagnostic information about the series of statements that affect, uh, that uh, are part of this race, along with their positions in the code. Uh, that, can, uh, that can help the, the developer understand and debug the, this issue. Uh, as I mentioned before, Silk Sun is a replacement for uh, Intel's Silk Screen. Uh, but the output here, I also want to highlight that there's two additional features in this output that were not found previously in uh, Silk Screen. One is, if you see on the left side of the right panel, there is this little ASCII art, which uh, offers a visual representation of the execution type of the, of the program that leads to the, to the determinacy race, such that uh, it can be easier to understand the, the reason for this, this particular race. And the other one is that uh, after this, uh, this technology formation, uh, it also includes an allocation context uh, in order to, to show better how which objects in memory are affected. In this particular case, it tells us that the, that the RACI uh, allocation context is an object, an array B, which resides in the stack. Other than that, execution uh, returns normally. And finally, the silk sand. Uh, uh, detector uh, outputs a summary of the total number of races that, uh, that were detected. Next slide, please. The other tool that is included in the, in the current release in beta 2 is the Silk Scale Scalability Analyzer, which is again an open source replacement for Intel's closed source uh, scalability analyzer, which went by the name of Silk View. Uh, Silk Scale allows uh, the user to analyze the performance and scalability of the entire program, as well as any user-specified region, using an API that is very similar to using uh, get time of day in C. Uh, there are also utilities in Silk Scale to facilitate automated benchmarking of uh, strong scaling in the, in the program under analysis. 
as well as a visualizer to, to plot the, the benchmarking results, in addition to the CSV output that is normally produced by the CXL analyzer, which can then be processed in any way that is desirable by the user. The, the current version of Silk Scale is uh, quite new, and as such, uh, has so far only been tested in about five Silk applications, and uh, we're doing more of that. But earlier, earlier versions, as with the other tools in the compiler, have been battle tested by, by numerous students as part of uh, their coursework, which involves Silk programming. Now, a brief example of what the, the results look like in this particular case. I'm showing the results using the Silk Scale Visualizer tool um, on a simple parallel quicksort code, which again you will see later in the hands on session. Uh, there are two plots here. Both of them um, correspond to, to a user specified region in the program uh, that only uh, covers the quicksort computations. On the left, we see a plot of the execution runtime of the program with respect to the number of parallel workers. And uh, this is run on a 40 core machine. And on the right, similarly, we see the relative speed up, or the speed up relative to, to sequential execution, again, with respect to the, the number of workers. And each of the plots contains four types of, uh, of data. One is the actual observed performances indicated by magenta dots. We have the, the green plot that shows what perfect linear speed that would look like. We also have the burden back bound as before, uh, which was also there in silk view, which is kind of a heuristic lower bound on the parallelism that one can get when uh, the extra overhead of work stealing is taken into consideration. And finally, there is this golden line that gives us uh, the span bound, which is a hard upper bound on the the speed up that one can hope to get with an infinite amount of parallel resources based on the span or critical path length of the program under analysis. Uh, next slide, please. And with that, I am yielding the floor over back to you. Thank you. So, um, so that's kind of an overview of what's in the package. Um, if we have the next slide. So let me um, talk a little bit about what releases there are. So um, as I mentioned, uh, in spring of 2020, we had uh, the beta one release uh, that we shared with some um, close friends uh, who we could afford to um, uh, uh, respond to bugs and so forth without it taking us off. We had originally planned that that would be more widely distributed, but we ran into uh, one of the ideas of having multiple betas was so that we could um, uh, uh, learn what we needed to do for each release so that we had a learning curve rather than do it all and then have one big you know, release. And so the beta one was really um, very helpful and uh, some of you may not be too surprised uh, to, uh, to uh, find out that the real thing that held us up there was licensing issues. Um, and we want to give it away, but there's also various things in some of the licenses talking about uh, what we warrant uh, about uh, the, uh, the release for all of the stuff that we owned completely. That was no problem. We released it under an MST, M MIT license, which is like a BSD license. It just says anybody can use it. They just have to keep the copyright on it. You can do whatever you want with it. You don't have, it's got no copy left, uh, viral propagation or anything. You can just take it, you can use it. You can modify it. The only thing you have to do is uh, make sure that the uh, copyright uh, stays on it. Um, the uh, the problem we ended up with was with the licensing of the uh, compiler, uh, which uh, we have to, by rules of LLVM, since it's an LLVM edition, we have to release that under the LLVM license. But the LLVM license encumbers the person who's releasing it to uh, also say that if you happen to use any technology uh, that is, you know, 
that is patentable or whatever, you're granting everybody a license to use it for that purpose. And MIT balked at that because they said we could be releasing something that would be um, uh, that would be uh, uh, encumbering other MIT uh, agreements that have nothing to do with this if we happen to use a technology. And we ended up uh, adding an addendum to the LLVM license that says, okay, uh, we're going to release it under the MIT license, but if you want to release it under the LLVM license, you go ahead and do that. And so hopefully that will satisfy everybody. The beta two we're hoping to get done. Um, uh, sorry, the beta two we just released last Friday, and that's the one that you'll be playing with if you're going to do the hands-on part of this uh, tutorial. Um, the beta three we are planning for late summer uh, to be ready to make sure if there are any problems with beta two and any enhancements that we want to do before people teach with it in the fall. I personally am teaching with it in the fall. I know several other places that plan to teach with it in the fall. And if you were a teacher, uh, you should plan to teach with it in the fall. Um, and then um, uh, the actual release where we're no longer going to call it a beta, we are expecting to be in the late fall. Um, I'm thinking sometime around uh, Thanksgiving. Maybe it gets punted till January. We'll have to see. We have to see what's involved in that. And part of it also depends on, uh, you know, the resources who I have actually working on it and so forth. Uh, after that, we are going to then be planning OpenSilk 2.0. In fact, we'll probably be planning OpenSilk 2.0 before then. And one of the reasons for this uh, tutorial is to get some feedback on what people would like to see in OpenSilk uh, 2.0. Uh, but with that, let me say what we expect to have in the full release, um, and in particular things that may augment things that we have in the beta release. Next slide. So, um, so here are some of the things that we expect. We expect to do performance engineering, i.e. make it faster. Um, we have several parts that I think we know how to make go faster. We just have not had the time to make them go faster. Uh, we also um, have uh, the um, uh, uh, missing functionality from, um, from uh, Intel Silk Plus. In particular, we do not currently support pedigrees and a deterministic pseudo random number generator. Uh, one of the things about most parallel computing platforms is that they don't have a deterministic parallel pseudo random number generator. And um, we want to have a parallel one. We know how to do it. It was, we did that. That was one of the major things, research uh, pieces of research that we did at MIT that we spun out and Intel adopted. Um, but we have not yet done that for, um, uh, for open silk. Uh, we expect to enhance our componentization, uh, including having a pluggable scheduler. Uh, this is going to be something that's ongoing, um, uh, but uh, where we will, we will try to restructure things to make it so that people can use parts of our system without necessarily eating the whole elephant uh, all the time. And so, um, so defining those APIs, and uh, I think there's a lot of you know, some of these things may involve some research. Uh, we're not funded uh, under by the NSF to do any research. This is all research infrastructure. We have to promise we won't do any research on in providing the infrastructure. But parallel computing is an ongoing thing, so we need to do research. So we're doing research outside of that funding, but then we hope to incorporate that. And I have uh, several colleagues who have talked to me about technologies that they have done research on that I would love to have incorporated in Open Silk, and so we're going to try to do that, uh, and try to make those be things that we can um, uh, plug in. So, given the large number of owls in the audience, uh, I think this is going to be really very interesting for us to negotiate with you how it is that we can make it so that you can use Open Silk to explore the things that you want to explore. Um, we have a compiler-based um, instrumentation framework 
that um, that uh, we have developed called CSI. Uh, we would like to, uh, we have used that actually to build our own tools. And so um, Silk Scale is uh, built upon our instrumentation framework. We call it CSI uh, for Comprehensive Static Instrumentation. Uh, we also um, have uh, uh, the race detector has got uh, it's not entirely a CSI tool, but it is a largely CSI tool. Um, we would like to enhance that and and get an API that lets people use it effectively. Uh, that is a fairly big job on its own to get this compiler-based instrumentation, the API set, and so forth. Uh, but we're hoping to do that. What that does is it allows people to build compiler-based tools without having to understand anything about the compiler. All they have to do is understand uh, the API that is provided. And so they implement various hooks. So for example, you can have a hook before a spawn or a hook, you know, um, uh, uh, before a memory access or after a memory access or, or whatever. And you just define what it is that you want. To, your tool defines what do you want have happened for that hook. And then when you compile it with instrumentation on, it uh, will call your tool, uh, you know, whatever the hook is that you've uh, implemented. And for all the hooks that you don't need, the compiler can eliminate them. And so you only run essentially with the uh, instrumentation that you need for your tool. And so that we think is a very important thing because we believe in the science of uh, of uh, parallel computing, and uh, which is kind of what the owls are uh, focused on. Uh, right now, this the runtime system, as with the Intel one, starts up automatically. Uh, we would like to have that be able to be done under programmer control. There are many cases where um, the programmer would just simply like to do that rather than relying on the um, startup of the runtime system and the shutdown to kind of happen automatically and make it more apparent. Um, and so we'd like to do that. Another thing that we are looking at uh, that we've had several people ask for is the ability to have multiple lowercase silks. So a silk is in some sense a silk job. And it kind of looks like from the point of view of other um, uh, it's actually more like a silk thread, I should say, not a job, okay? It's more like a thread. It's more like P-thread, except that it's a parallel P-thread. And we would like to have multiple parallel P-threads and be able to have people um, uh, uh, say something about how that those threads get allocated to the various parts of their machine. Um, so, for example, Guy Blelick mentioned to me his application where he has a an application where he's implemented it in silk and then he has he wants to have another thread that throws load at it which is also parallel and also programmed in silk and he would like to make sure that the two runtimes do not interfere but he wants to keep them um, in the same uh, you know in the same job on two separate threads but be able to throw load and be able to measure the the um, uh, a library that under test with m minimal interference from the part of the system that is uh, generating the load. And uh, John Gilbert mentioned to me the need where he wants to um, be able to have an MPI uh, on a node of a computer and be able to take one of the MPI threads and make it be a parallel silk thread to do the stuff that's on core. And so we're looking at how we can implement multiple silks. Uh, uh, we also have a design for improved reducer syntax, and uh, we uh, that that van makes it much easier to use reducers and much easier for students and so forth. And so we would like to get that in as soon as possible. Uh, we have uh, we would like to enhance our productivity tools. Uh, silk View and Silk Scale are kind of minimal in the UIs. If people are interested in doing UI development for those tools, I would love to have, um, you know, uh, I hope that we have componentized those well enough that people can say, hey, I have my interface for that. 
and gee, you know, I wish you would implement this functionality and then I can, you know, make it. So we're hoping to do a lot there. And then we're also interested in enabling user groups and, uh, and such. And so, um, uh, uh, we uh, may I say groups because it may be uh, suitable to have eagles and owls have kind of separate groups. I don't know. Um, and so uh, we are interested in, um, you know, in how people can do that, who, how we can organize beta testers so that people can test, but we're not overwhelmed uh, and so forth. And, um, and then, uh, and that's kind of the focus of this um, Q and a session. Uh, what ideas do you have that might be in one point, the full 1.0 or beyond? Um, so next slide. And so that brings us to the Q and A. So, um, so we're going to, after the Q and A, uh, we'll chat for a few minutes and then we'll have a break and then we'll do the hands on. So for the Q and A, I think it would be good to just enable everybody to unmute if they will and review so that we can all, um, we're not at the break yet, we're at the Q&A, uh, go to the gallery view so that people can start to ask uh, some questions orally, uh, as well as, you know, if people want to do them in the chat, you can do it in the Slack chat, you can do it there as well. But um, I'm happy given the number we have, I think it'll be okay to take them orally. Can we uh, stop the share? Yep. Okay. We're not at the break. We're not at the hands on session. There we go. Okay. Good. We have a lot of people there. So uh, if you could unmute it, and ideally, if to stop your video, if you're gonna, if you're gonna talk, um, that would be great, uh, so that we can see who's talking. Um, you may want to be on speaker view, or you may want to be on gallery view. We have a fair number of people. Um, so any questions about? Um, the the basic capabilities of open silk and uh, and so forth. So Charles, so I this is Roberto Volmieri. Let me let me start uh, the Q and A by wondering uh, what's the direction that you envision the team envisions for silk towards heterogeneous computation. Uh, do you plan to be able to spawn a bunch of threads on the CPU and maybe with affinity on a GPU, maybe using OpenCL, maybe not? Uh, if, if there is a direction in that direction, if you're looking or if you're thinking that it's something um, that it's worth to work on? TB, you want to take that? Sure. Um, I think that's a really exciting question. I think there are a lot of exciting research questions that come along for the ride. Um, hopefully you, uh, hopefully you agree. Um, I would say one of the, uh, and I'm personally really excited to, to uh, explore some of that research. Uh, I would say one of the key things that we're hoping uh, to get from open silk itself uh, is a framework to support that kind of research. And, to support it through the componentized structure of OpenSilk. So if you want to explore an alternative runtime system that contains work stealing aspects, but also understands that there are GPUs and maybe FPGAs and other complicated heterogeneous hardware on your system, and it can do something clever with that hardware, uh, you should be able to develop that runtime system and plug it in with the rest of the OpenSilk infrastructure. Uh, so you can write silk code and, you know, have things scheduled on silk code along with whatever other necessary code there may be and have things scheduled on those different uh, hardware components. Uh, yeah, similarly, like sorry. sorry, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, oh, similarly, say, oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> you finished. I'm sorry. I don't want to interrupt. Yeah. I mean, similarly, uh, research in the compiler space would could touch on uh, how do you deal with heterogeneous hardware? And having you know, the compiler being its own component uh, lets you explore some of that research as well. There is, a, yeah. there is a 
sorry, Charge, before, uh, just, just, to, just to follow up, there is this uh, exciting technology like, uh, well, I don't know if everybody feels that it's exciting, but like unified memory, uh, being able for, depending on the, the devices, to be able to access the same part of the memory, uh, that kind of enables this idea of having a unique infrastructure where uh, you see everything and you can schedule things for executions, whatever. It would be kind of um, you know, kind of great to think that it's easy to program this kind of infrastructure. Yeah, I would say at this point, that's definitely research. And just to emphasize something that uh, TB said, um, uh, indeed, what we're hoping is, A, people can do research on these kinds of things okay, with the open silk uh, infrastructure. And then B, that there becomes a relatively uh, easy path for uh, the research to become available, you know, in the system and supported in the system. So that, uh, so that, uh, you know, it can be available. We want there to be a conduit for the development of this technology from the research people. So it serves the needs of the researchers as well as serves the needs of the eagles who are going to be, have the basis. And I, I kind of feel like, you know, if we can make that um, technology transition effective, then our sponsors will be very happy with what we've been able to do. Okay. Um, and I think all the researchers uh, who work on this, this will be, you, it is so much harder to do this in, in other systems than silk to get something where you take, you know, a bunch of silk applications that you've already got and say, let's, let's run them uh, with my change. It, it's very hard to do that with other systems, you know, uh, uh, you know, some people can do it, but it takes high, you know, the, the bar is very high and we would like to lower the bar so that there's more opportunity for doing that. And certainly the direction of heterogeneous is, is uh, you know, like what's the model? How does it interact? You know, demonstrate a system to us. Hey, you can demonstrate a system in the context of what everybody is already doing. So there's a so it's not like you built your own system and you say, oh, go do this. And it's like, oh, when you look at it, it's like, oh, but you're doing this, which can't work with something else. No, we'll know right up front that it can work. Uh, John, you want to um, have your hand raised? John Miller Crummy, you got to um, unmute. Can, do I have to unmute you or can you unmute? I'm clicking unmute, but it doesn't do anything. I think he's there. You go. There we go. You're on. Okay. So previously, it said that nobody could unmute themselves. Okay. So the the first thing that I tried was I downloaded the package, and it won't work on the Red Hat Seven, which is what we run on the servers at Rice. And what I found is that in the source package, it's not clear how to build it. Yeah, that might have to go offline, but. The, yeah, uh, the source package of uh, OpenSilk Beta 2? Yep. Yes. Um, good question. There are instructions for building from source in, uh, a, in a separate repository, including some scripts to help you along the way. Um, See for let's, let me take that offline, because I think it's easier to just send you links via you know, a chat mechanism. Yeah, and we can we can do that during the Q and A session. If if we're if we're lucky, we can you know I don't know whether you'll be able to complete the compile if you're building from source, but uh, but hopefully um, you know there may be enough time to to try to do that. And so we'll we'll hook you up with somebody who can help doing you know do that with you. Okay, sounds good. Thanks. So raise your hand if you'd like to ask any questions about teaching, about the future, what uh, features oh, you want uh, to see. Excuse me, uh, my name is Mike, and how to hey, raise my hand, I don't know. Okay, um, yeah, there's oh, a- the floor. 
That's fine. Um, You've got the floor. Well, I, I can talk. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Very interesting. Nice talk. if you could see your uh, if you turn on your video as well. Oh, video. Uh, okay. Then let me try. Uh, let me try. Yes. There we go. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for the very interesting talk. Um, my question is regarding how uh, are you planning to do any research on the uh, how this application, this parallel uh, um, parallel uh, parallelization or parallel behavior, will interact with the job skill there, like the slurum, son of this, um, grid engine, and so on. Uh, so um, let me say something, and then let me turn it to um, TV and Angelina to respond. So. Yes, we would like to make things more interoperable um, in the longer term with a lot of other things. And interoperability is very important to people. Uh, but that is not one of our current um, top priorities for OpenSoap 1.0. Uh, and part of the issue with interoperability from our point of view is the limited number of people we have to work on it. But we're hoping that the system will be sufficiently available that people who want to do a particular thing cannot just recommend that it be done but can can show us how to do it and then and then we can incorporate that um, so um, but I do think there's certain things like slurm which um, we may not be able to wait for somebody else to do it we may have to then at some point bite the bullet and do those kinds of things ourselves um, so TV or Angelina do you want to add Uh, I guess I'm a little uh, unclear on the question specific to Slurm. Oh, no, in general, Slurm and the uh, Son of Grid Engine is the uh, most popular at this time. Uh, but for any job scheduler on the high performance computing clusters on HPCs. I see. Uh, as in, are we interested? So, are we interested in having OpenSilk work with such job schedulers and on? these HPC systems. Uh, I would say certainly. I think we were interested in having OpenSilk work on a variety of uh, platforms. Um, and I would say also yeah. that the multiple silks, you know, one of the questions is, well, how are you going to organize those multiple silks? And one possibility would be a Slurm interface to help with that, you know, a Slurm API. Uh, we have not figured out exactly what we're doing Right now, we're working on the basic capability of multiple silks. Uh, we have not worked on yet the API for how we would export that, how we would manage that, and so forth. Uh, Angelina, do you want to say something here? Um, yeah, so I think it will be nice. But as Charles mentioned right now, that's not the top priority. Um, however, we are hoping to move the runtime in the direction where it can be very modular and set up so that uh, it has a API for which people can easily extend the runtime to plug in their own schedule of policy that they want to test out. Um, sort of this is something planned for the future. The pluggable runtime scheduling framework is something that is of some priority. And we hope that whenever that's developed, the community can take it and just try it out and extend it to be interoperable with other framework or other system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for, uh, for the answer. And uh, we are trying, uh, for instance, MPI, we didn't take an MPI, message basic interface, the most dominant technique for parallelization. Um, we have a lot of troubles uh, with, uh, um, with the, uh, it is not elastic. So, so you, if you are asking the more, more, more resources which is available in the system, MPA does not handle this. And MPA has many other problems as well. So we are trying to create our own techniques to avoid all these problems. Sure. But it would be nice if you can take into account all these efficiencies we published in our publication. Good. Well, I hope that we will uh, enable um, some of that work. Other questions? John. Gilbert. Yeah, I, I just wanted to follow up and say that um, I think an interesting model would be um, silk with open silk with open shmem, where you know you would use slurm or something to to launch a big job on a distributed memory machine, and maybe 
maybe initially just each node runs one silk and they don't talk to each other at all, but they all talk to talk to open Schmemp. Um, it, it, it sort of feels to me like silk and the, the PGAS open Schmemp model uh, are, are in some ways more compatible than an MPI yes. plus silk kind of thing. Okay. Mm -hmm. And there's a main application of this kind. Like yeah, Mike. Model and simulation. Michael uh, Speer. My question is in a slightly different direction, but um, in terms of teaching with silk, um, I'm worried that this fall, my students are gonna be in 14 different time zones and are all gonna need me to help them install software on their computer. And I have found in the past that if I can give them just a Docker file even that tells them how to get started, then usually I can avoid most of the configuration problems and my students can get started pretty quickly. So I think you had said Ubuntu 18.04 but Docker is Ubuntu is now 20, so I would encourage you to prioritize Ubuntu 2004 because a Docker file means that students can use any IDE, do their development, and have very little configuration pain. TB, you want to respond? Uh, sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, okay, I'm not muted. You can hear me, right? Yep. yep. Great. Um, I'll give you a little bit of a, of a teaser just because you mentioned specifically Ubuntu 2004. Um, what we found with the binaries we currently have available on the release, uh, there are, is that I, I think it was Alexandrus who tried installing those binaries on his, on his Ubuntu 2004 system and it worked for him. So we at least have one date, one positive data point, um, <laughs> which means it's pretty much ready to go. No, anyway. Uh, <laughs> uh, so yeah, uh, more broadly speaking, when it comes to packaging, uh, we do want to make OpenSilk accessible. Uh, we want to make it easy to get and easy to use, uh, as well as easy to modify. Um, for the hands-on part of, the, uh, of this tutorial, we're recommending that people uh, download and install the binaries if they are able to, uh, just because downloading and installing a binary takes order of a few minutes, depending on your internet connection and building, well, what's essentially LLVM from source code can take hours. And we're, we don't want to sit around waiting for hours to see if the source would build. Um, we are interested in other forms of packaging uh, we're also limited in our uh, capacity for uh, for uh, implementing stuff and testing stuff and making sure that it is robust and ready to go. Uh, so for example, with this tutorial, we prioritized making the source available and making at least binaries available for installation on some of the common modern Linux uh, and Unix-like systems. Um, down the road, uh, I think we're, I think they're, I think we are interested in looking at other packaging, uh, setups. Um, Docker has been mentioned a couple of times. Um, I think we had a suggestion of Ubuntu, of an Ubuntu PPA, uh, or a SPAC package, uh, on the, uh, on the or Slack. R RPMs. RPMs would be for, uh, Fedora or Red Hat. If I recall, um, but yeah, well, uh, it's on our, you know, we're, we're aware of it and we're, 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 uh, considering what we can, what we can provide. It's probably safe to say that any one Docker file would work because mo especially for teaching, I don't think most of the students are going to be able to tell the difference between whether we give them Fedora or Ubuntu or Slackware or something, but, um, just having one Docker file so that people can easily get started would, I think, would be the, the best thing. And uh, are you, uh, do your, what uh, operating system do your students use generally? They don't well, that's, that's they the don't beauty care. of Docker is then it doesn't matter. Well, is, is that Docker creates uh, an entirely configured virtual environment inside of whatever you've got. So, um, 
my right. students will so have the performance issues are going to be you know mitigated so for example if you're running docker on windows you know if you install the docker thing on windows there's going to be it's not clear you know it's not something we've tested i think if sure. it's a more native environment then we would probably be okay but um yeah i mean it's basically inside of a vm when it's running on windows yeah and so we found that there are there can be given the low level nature of some of the stuff in the runtime system there can be anomalies that you get uh you know when you provide something that's going to run uh virtually on some other platform and uh and so we still would even though the functionality will translate whether the performance and so forth that you translate in some sense you know what's the point of paralyzing something if the performance doesn't uh, if it runs slower you know if it runs slower or something right so um so we do need to check that and so forth um, I, so about five more minutes and then we want to take a, a five minute break uh for people and then we'll come back and do the hands-on and as i mentioned the hands-on includes a uh a demo uh, so if even if you're not going to do the hands-on itself, uh, you're welcome to um, uh, to demo the uh, you know to watch the demos, uh, which uh, which I think you'll uh, enjoy as well. Any other uh, any other questions? Hi Charles Uzi. <laughs> uh, Hi Uzi. I wanted to ask about this exact issue of performance that you uh, pointed out recently in your recent comment. Uh, what uh, what can you do when when uh, Intel say gives you a small number of cores? So, to what extent or what would be the ideal uh, platforms that are, uh, are still going on where you would recommend? using for for your uh, platform well if you look um Lucy, if you look at the cloud the number of cores that has um that they have offered has in the last three years skyrocketed compared to what it was before okay so you can get bigger and bigger machines and now you know i looked for example and i know it's not you know in the thousands but uh you know i looked at uh, aws um a little um, a while ago, uh, uh, actually, my uh, student, Tim Kaler, looked at this, and if I, and so I'm going to do this from memory, and I may not get it exactly right, but it turned out that you could rent a 32-core uh, machine on AWS cheaper than a single GPU machine, okay? So the cost performance of the multi-cores is still far and away better than the cost performance of GPUs. Now that doesn't mean that for some people GPUs aren't essential for the, you know, how quickly they can do it. But, but you know, there are larger and larger systems being made available on, I think you can now get even um, uh, like 80 cores on AWS or something. I don't remember what the, the number is, but the number has been growing as people have been demanding uh, larger um, machines. Now I understand. There's nothing I can do with software that uh, you know that uh, adds the number of cores to your machine, right? That, you know, uh, and so and yet I do find that we still are underutilizing that the most cost-effective you know commodity component. You know, the multi-core is the commodity component. It's the cheapest way we know to build computing right now. The special-purpose stuff is fast and so forth, but it is not necessarily economical for general workloads. And I do think that we are headed for an era which, uh, that, you know, which is involved in heterogeneous uh, computing. Uh, but, um, but I think that, you know, uh, and of course there's a lot of attention being paid to uh, the special devices, et cetera, as well there should be. Uh, but that doesn't mean we're done with the general purpose environment. And in fact, in, in some sense, I'm quite disappointed that we haven't made more progress on the general purpose environment. 
because I think they're, as I say, it's cost effective and it can be done much better than it currently is. Uh, I would love to see more cores, you know. Um, th did I answer your question? Uh, I, I think so. So you don't uh, uh, see uh, uh, your, your uh, software platform extending beyond a single system, like, you know, if you have two, uh, like, several, uh, se several, say, 32 core things. Uh, I, I just, I'm trying just to understand the scope of what you are. Trying. Yeah, so I think to begin with, you know, I'd rather draw the scope small and be excellent, you know, but indeed, I think there's going to be a lot of pressure to, you know, just as, as um, John Gilbert was mentioning, you know, that you know, having a solution that supercomputers can use that makes it interoperate easily, or at some point I could even see taking on, okay, we want something where the whole thing interoperates well, you know. Um, but I think right now there's plenty of work to be done just on the multi-cores for us, especially given that we do not have, you know, the engineering team at Intel, uh, you know, at one point was, um, you know, uh, a dozen or 15 people. And, uh, you know, we have an engineering team uh, that is, let me just say, much smaller. Uh, we basically have um, two FTEs in some sense uh, when you, aggregate the work by everybody. Now, fortunately, the two, the, the dominant part of those two FTEs is by people who are really, really good, okay? But we, we do not have the resources, which is why this in the end has to be a community effort. And why, uh, you know, uh, I think our first job is to make it be something that people find indispensable um, and then uh, that gives us the, um, you know, the ammunition to, um, you know, uh, get additional support and grow it and so forth. Okay. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I of course, completely agree with the sentiment that <laughs> we, would all, or we would all like to see more uh, calls coming down the pike from, from the chief vendors in the space. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Mike again, and I don't know how to raise my hand. And uh, I could add a few comments if, if, you, if I can. I, I, I prefer to have questions at this point because uh, otherwise what I would like to do is go to a break and then uh, we can uh, still have discussion going on uh, during some of the hands-on. Okay, no problem. Okay. Okay, well then let's go to break. Uh, so we'll have a break for five minutes. It's right now. Uh, uh, Eastern time, it is uh, about 2.32, so why don't we break until 2.40, and at that point, uh, we'll do the hands-on, and um, uh, I think you'll see, it, it begins with a demo, so I think you'll be very, um, uh, very interested, but I think people need to get up and stretch and, and so okay. forth, okay? I'm sorry. So, uh, uh, Dorothy, can you just put up the slide, the first slide for the... Um, for the hands-on, the, the um, outline slide for hands-on. Oh yeah, hey, uh, Mike. Oh, just a logistics thing. If yeah. people want to chat, we have the gather space set up oh, yeah. so you can follow the directions to go to gather and then you can meet in small groups and communicate. So if anyone wants to try that out, now is a great time. And we have a few people already walking around in Slack, in, uh, sorry, in gather. Good. Okay. So.
Yeah, sure. Sure, sure, sure. Yep. Uh, yep.
So I, I think we will uh, begin the next uh, uh, the next uh, phase here, which is to um, which is the open uh, silk uh, demo and uh, hands on. So TB, you want to take it away? Sure thing. Can you hear me? Yep. All right. So I'm going to start sharing my screen. Uh, so, it, all right. Great. How can I mute gather? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so can everyone see this Emacs buffer and a copy of the slides on the right? I think maybe people need, need to mute themselves and so, gather so, to yes. avoid echoes. Yeah. It's looking good, TB. OK. There we go. All right, so shall we get started? Let's go ahead and get started. This is my first experience running a, uh, a demo or frankly a tutorial since um, all of this quarantining stuff started up and uh, well, this is going to be fun, um, or at least I hope everyone will have some fun. So thank you all for uh, for attending. Uh, now let's get now let's uh, shift gears from talking and and try some stuff out. Now the goal of this tutorial is not to teach Silk programming. The goal of this tutorial is to just give you a little bit of a, a tour of what's available in open in the Open Silk beta release. Uh, that you can now download. Um, and hopefully, if you're able to follow along, uh, try you know, running some of these commands, compiling some Silk codes, and using some of the tools uh, that are available. Um, I noticed in Slack there's some mention of an echo. I, I, I hear well, TB, so... Um... Yeah, so Angelina said the same. So I think you're, you're good. You can keep going. Yeah, let's all right. mute it all just to make sure there's no other things going on. I think uh, Roberto said he muted people in Gather or asked people to mute in Gather. All right, great. Um, so you can now download the latest OpenSilk release from the GitHub, uh, the GitHub page shown on the slide on the right. Uh, on that page, or for the latest release, you should be able to find a couple of uh, options for installing binaries. There are some Linux binaries that are available. Uh, for example, in the package OpenSilk 901-Linux.sh, uh, there are some binaries available that uh, that work for Mac OS X 10.14 or newer. Um, those are in a similarly named package, but instead of Linux, it's Darwin. Um, 
There are also instructions available to build OpenSilk from source. Uh, in our experience, building from source takes much, much longer than installing the binary. So if possible, we recommend downloading the binaries and, uh, and using those to, uh, to do the installation. Uh, moreover, the code for this tutorial you can find uh, also in the Silk, sorry, OpenSilk GitHub organization uh, in the repository named tutorial. Um, and that just contains a few simple Silk codes. One of them is a copy of everyone's favorite doubly exponentially bad way of computing Fibonacci numbers. And that's what's shown in the Emacs buffer on the left here. Uh, all we have, so this is a, this is a uh, exponential time Fib computation uh, that has been parallelized using the spawn and sync keywords. I won't go through the parallelization of Fib uh, at this time. I'm, I hope many of you have already seen this at some point in the past. Uh, but you know, to get started, at least with the basics, I think what I'll do is go through all of the demonstration steps just to show you uh, what's happening. And then we can uh, rewind and allow you to uh, uh, try things out yourself. And we have many people on hand here for, uh, to provide a hands-on technical assistance. So here we have exponential time fib. If you want to compile, compile this using OpenSilk, the main things you need to do are include the silk slash silk.h header file, and then compile it on the command line using clang and the dash f OpenSilk flag. Uh, the header file should be pretty familiar to anyone who's used silk uh, in the past few years. So hopefully there are no real surprises here. So let's just go ahead and try try compiling that code. Um, in my case, I've got OpenSilk available in a directory called OpenSilk install. And there's Clang inside of the bin directory in that install. Of course, if you add things to your path, that can make things easier. But uh, I play around with lots of installations of the compiler. So having some separation turns out to be handy in my case. Um, advance the slide so you know, can see what I'm doing. So we're just going to evoke Clang, uh, ask it to output an executable, executable name fib. Uh, the uh, compile unit is fib.c. And we can turn on any optimization flag we want. In this case, we'll just turn on 03. And we need the f-f open silk flag to compile this silk code. We run that. By the way, I'm doing these uh, compilations and runs on a, uh, on a supercomputing node that I have access to just because that, that particular machine happens to have a lot of cores available. Um, obviously, your mileage may vary in terms of performance or the pretty graphs that will generate later, uh, depending on the machine that you, uh, that you use. OK, so we've compiled fib. And now we can just run it. We run it. We see fib of 35 is this value. Um, and that's pretty much all there is to compiling and running with uh, OpenSilk. We can see a little bit, a little bit of evidence uh, that Silk is in fact working. If we take the timing of Fib35, we see that it runs very, very quickly. If we were to, for example, uh, force this to run serially, which we can do by setting the Silk N workers environment variable and just setting that to one. This will force the silk computation to run on one worker. When we do that, we see that it takes longer to run. OK, so at least FIB seems to be doing something in parallel based on the number of silk workers. Feel free to post any questions to the uh, Slack channel uh, as we go. So that's pretty much all there is to uh, compiling and running. That's the basics of compiling and running with OpenSilk. Uh, now I want to show you some of the tools, because uh, those have prettier interfaces. So first, I want to show you how to use the SilkSAN race detector. Uh, and for this, we'll use a different code in the, tutorial, uh, in the tutorial directory. In this case, we'll be using the nqueens.c file, which uh, you saw a snippet of earlier. 
I can just open it, open up that file here. Um, there's there's substantially more code uh, within this file. Uh, what this what this is doing is counting the number of solutions to uh, how to place n queens on an n by n board for a given input value n. Um, and this code, in fact, does contain a race, uh, as you may recall from one of the previous slides. Now, if you are staring at this code, you may have to stare at it for a very long time in order to uh, see the race. And it's hard to tell, well, how long, it's hard to see where the race is just from reading this code. Uh, you could be staring for, uh, for quite a while. Um, this is where SilkSan turns out to be really handy. What you can do with SilkSan is just uh, run the Silk program through the race detector, and that will analyze the execution of the program. And if there are any determinacy races in that code, it'll, uh, it'll throw a warning. So what we're going to do to use SilkSan, we're going to once again invoke Clang. This time, we're going to compile the nQueens code. So output to nQueens. Input file is nQueens.c. We need the dash f open silk flag once again. Um, and for this, we're going to use dash f sanitize equals silk. And that's going to turn on the silk san tool. Silk san is a compiler based, uh, is a compiler based tool. And so to turn it on, we pass this particular compiler flag, dash f sanitize equals silk, uh, in order to, um, in order to use the tool. Now, when compiling stuff for race detection, you still have choices in how much you optimize. We tend to recommend something like this, uh, dash OG dash G. OG is an optimization level that is uh, generally uh, desirable for debugging programs. It does a little bit of optimization, but not so much as to mess up the debug symbols. And so ideally, you end up with something which is relatively easy to interpret. And then the dash G flag uh, simply enables debug symbols so that when we run this code, we get meaningful output in terms of lines of source code where things uh, that are relevant to the race. So we're just going to compile this end queens code. Uh, I think I must have warmed up the caches on this parallel file system, so that compiled much faster. Um, and now we just run it. And for our purposes, we'll run this uh, on a 12 by 12 board. And we run it, and poof. Right away, we get a report from SilkSan describing this race. It says that there's a race detected at this memory address. It specifies the two endpoints of the race. One of them is a read uh, at, at line 62 of nQueens.c. Um, the other one is a write at line 65 of nQueens.c. And if we hop back to the nQueens code itself, Line 62 happens to correspond to this mem copy here that hopefully you can see highlighted. And if we look at the race report, that read was to the variable a. Oops. Um, and so indeed, this mem copy is reading the variable a uh, as it performs the, uh, the copy operation. The other endpoint of the race is line 65, if I remember correctly, yes. Um, and that's, that's this location where we're assigning something to the array B. Uh, and so it can be a little bit confusing. Why, why do we have a race between A and B? Well, it turns out that uh, if we look at the read endpoint of the race based on this race detector output, um, the the branching point of that of the race, the place where things started to happen in parallel, uh, was this spawn on line 67. So there is a spawn to end queens. And the way that shows up in the race report is that we have a spawn and then a call above that in this, uh, in this stack. And we basically represent both the spawn and the call as separate entries, since with OpenSilk, you can uh, you can spawn things that aren't just simple function calls. Uh, sorry, so there is a question in the Slack. Do, uh, do you envision issues with the O3 code or in general in coping with more aggressive optimizations? Um, 
are, is this a question in the context of race detection or more broadly speaking? Ah, um, yeah, so the, so when you're doing debugging, uh, what can often happen, uh, this is true of many, many tools, including GDB and Valgrin and that sort of thing. Uh, when you enable really aggressive compiler optimization, that gives the compiler license to do all sorts of crazy things to the code. And while it's doing these optimizations, stuff like function inlining uh, to arbitrary levels uh, and that sort of thing, um, it can lose track of exactly which lines of the assembly code correspond to uh, which lines of the original source code. And as a result, uh, you can get output with debug symbols in it, uh, but it will be, it can be a lot more confusing to interpret uh, unless you're sort of aware of the fact that the compiler is doing a lot of these uh, aggressive optimizations to, to change the code. So that's why we tend to recommend a lower optimization level. So you get a little bit of performance benefit, but can still more easily understand what's going on. If Silk had some better help with optimizations enabled. Let me just unmute myself. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Uh, because, yeah, because like you said, it's always a problem the bugging with minus O3. I was wondering if Silk had that like goal in mind to, especially the race addiction part, to uh, to address some of the issues that the other debuggers uh, uh, fail, uh, which is when you enable optimizations, uh, you have all kind of weird things happening when you do the bugging. I was just wondering. I see. If there's a, if there's a separate goal in OpenSilk yeah, yeah, to... Yeah to make that more reasonable. Right. Um, because of, uh, you know, open circuits meant to parallelization uh, and, uh, um, and so optimizations kind of get along with that. And so I was just wondering. Yeah, uh, I think, so we, in general, uh, I think even for serial code, there's interest in making the debug symbols more reasonable, uh, even when you have really aggressive optimizations. Uh, but that's, uh, I think right now our feeling on that is that's a that's as much a problem for Silk code as it is for ordinary serial code. And we're, for open Silk, we're, uh, we're focusing on the, on more of the Silk issues, I suppose. Uh, I'm not quite sure if that addresses the question, but. No, no, I, I understand the position, yes, thanks. Um, if our, one of our goals is if there is innovation when it comes to serial code, if there are improvements to serial optimizations or to how debug symbols are managed, uh, we'd like to be able to take all of those uh, improvements to serial compilation and make them and apply them to silk code as, insofar as they are applicable. Uh, the taper LVM compiler gives us some ability to do that. And one of the goals with OpenSilk is to keep the latest release of OpenSilk, I'd say, up to date with what's going on uh, with recent uh, releases of LLVM. So right now, uh, OpenSilk is based on LLVM 9. Uh, there is a release of LLVM 10, and there will soon be a minor, uh, a minor release of LLVM uh, for 10.0.1. Uh, I think around that time, we're planning to uh, essentially upgrade OpenSilk to be based on LLVM 10 rather than LLVM 9. And looking forward, uh, doing this kind of upgrading so that, so that users always have access to, uh, to the latest compiler technology. That is something that we want to do. So that's more broad Thanks. than debug symbols, but uh, <laughs> yeah, hopefully thanks. that makes some sense. So anyway, so I, think, I think at 03, it would detect a race, but you wouldn't be able to figure out where the race was because the. Yeah, the, I mean, the, um, so I think with N queens, the debug symbols are probably mostly reasonable, even if I crank up the optimization level. We can just try it. Um, yeah, OK, it's fine. Um, 
I guess we got kind of lucky with end queens that things were uh, things are relatively nice when it comes to the optimizations. Um, if I didn't compile with uh, with debug symbols, then you know what does it look like? Okay, well that doesn't help me as much as a as a programmer. I guess there are er there are races, or at least there's one race. No, sorry, there are uh, three, four, seven, nine, three, six, seven. Sorry, three, six, eight races in this particular code when I run it on n equals twelve. Um, and it's in nqueens.c. I probably could have guessed that from the fact that it was the only thing I compiled. But, you know, it's... Uh, if you um, had a new, new program and you didn't know whether it had any races at all. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Or if there's a race uh, due to how some underlying complicated library you're using happens to manage memory and you had no idea. Like... Uh, I'm not sure if this actually happened, but maybe you're writing some image processing code that uses OpenCV and you start parallelizing stuff and unbeknownst to you, the parallelization uh, interacts badly with OpenCV because internally OpenCV is using free lists to maintain, uh, uh, to maintain local allocations of matrices. And suddenly you're getting races on those free lists. Um, you, didn't you didn't write OpenCV necessarily, uh, but if you compile the program, you know, OpenC, if you compile the program with SilkSand instrumentation, uh, you should get some visibility into uh, the races stemming from, uh, from the OpenCV library, I suspect. It's been a long time since I looked at OpenCV, so I might be getting some details wrong, but hopefully uh, you, you get the sentiment. Maybe how do you handle the external libraries? I know that the Intel race detector was based on PIN, and so it would do binary instrumentation of the yep. third party libraries. With the SilkSan, you're just, you're instrumenting every load and store of the application we compiled. Yes. Um, so right now, uh, with certain libraries, that's okay. Uh, a lot of C++, for a lot of C++ libraries, a substantial amount of code ends up being in header files. Uh, and when that happens, we end up instrumenting all of that code. Uh, so that's that's actually not too big an issue. Uh, it's one th something that we want to do with SilkSan is expand the support for libraries. There's some infrastructure in the compiler code base currently uh, that comes with the other sanitizer tools. These are uh, these are tools produced by Google for doing memory checking or uh, or checking for undefined behavior or that sort of thing. Uh, and there's some uh, infrastructure in there for dealing with uh, for dealing with libraries. Um, when it comes to arbitrary libraries, generally the recommendation is compile that library with the F sanitize equals silk flag enabled, which yes can be a burden. But that's um, currently that's uh, what we're able to support. Uh, so. For, for, for the end queens example, you're actually using memcopy. So yes. is that, does that end up being like an inline copy of memcopy? Yeah, so for end queens, we're using memcopy. And the way uh, LLVM handles that on Linux is to uh, represent memcopy as a, as a compiler built-in. And so SilkSan actually recognizes that, the SilkSan compiler pass actually recognizes that built-in and says, oh, I see you're doing a mem copy. That means you're, access, you're reading the, this set of locations and you're writing to this other set of locations. So I'm gonna represent that to the race detector. Um, now, that's not true of every, that's not true of every um, library routine. Um, and you know, looking at uh, one, of the, one of the challenges is that there's a lot of variation in exactly how these uh, library operations get represented at the compiler level. Because sometimes the compiler wants to be able to optimize around those library calls. And other times it just says, well, you're calling some function. I don't know what it does. I'll just leave it as a function call and assume the worst. Um, it turns out uh, when we were prepping the tutorial, uh, we discovered that on Mac OS X, if you run 
Clang in that environment, it uses a different built-in for memcopy, and it's a built-in that we don't currently recognize, um, which is why we, as you can see on the slide, recommend compiling with this additional flag. Um, obviously, down the this is beta software. Obviously, down the road, we want to uh, handle more of those cases. Um, it's a challenging problem, but uh, that's something that we're that we're working on. That makes sense. Yes, thanks. Cool. Yeah, there are a lot of built-ins in the compiler. Uh, all right, so that was a lot on SilkSan. Um, let's go ahead and move on and talk about the other tool at our disposal. Uh, and that's SilkScale, the scalability analyzer. Now, once again, SilkScale is a, uh, is a compiler-based tool. So once again, in order to use SilkScale, we're going to pass another flag uh, to the compilation of our program uh, that will enable SilkScale so that when we run the program, we're also running SilkScale. For this part of the demo, uh, we're going to use the QSort, uh, the QuickSort uh, code in the tutorial directory. Uh, once again, this is more substantial than exponential time fib. Um, I'll allow you to browse through this code uh, on your own for the uh, by and large, but we will talk a little bit about some specific points in this code uh, later on when we explore the Silk Scale API. But for now, let's just go ahead and compile this as ordinary Silk code using the Silk Scale tool. So to do that, I'm going to pull up. I'll put QSort, QSort.c, f open silk once again. And this time we're going to pass dash f silk tool equals silk scale. And since we're not doing any debugging with silk scale, we're just looking at performance. Let's crank up the optimizations all the way to three. Um, compile that. Now, by default, QSort runs on a pretty small input. Uh, so let's give it a bigger input to run on just so we get some interesting data. Let's say 10 million. All right. So what we see here is the normal output of uh, quicksort, which says it's sorting 10 million integers. Then it does a check and it says, well, all sorts succeeded. And then at the very end, we have some CSV output, which uh, encodes the work span, parallelism, burden span, and burden parallelism for the overall computation. Now. By default, the CSV gets output to the same, uh, just a standard out. We can change that, however, uh, if we don't want to pollute our output with silk scale output um, by setting the environment variable silk scale underscore out equals, let's give it a file name. How about qsort.csv? Compile and run that. Now we just see the ordinary output of qsort. And if we cat uh, the CSV file, there's a CSV we get. Because it's a CSV, if you have a favorite spreadsheet program, you can go ahead and open it up in that program and manipulate the data however you like. Now, by default, QuickSort analyzes the whole execution of the program from the start to the end. And while that's useful, sometimes we don't want to know about the whole execution. Sometimes we just want to know about a specific region of the execution. In the quicksort example, if we take a look at the driver code in main, we see that, the, that a bunch of stuff happens uh, before we actually run quicksort. We get the number of uh, integers to, to sort, do some argument checking, do some memory allocation, initialize the array, and then we ultimately call sample qsort on the array uh, in order to do the quicksort. And then after all of that is done, we actually do checking to make sure that the sort indeed succeeded. And we print out some, some stuff about whether the sort succeeded or how many sorts failed. And then we free, uh, just free the memory. So all of this is good to have in a driver, but we don't necessarily care about it if we really want to understand, well, why did my quicksort code not get very much parallel performance? 
So let's use the Silk Scale API in order to analyze just this, uh, just this one call to sample QSort. And in order to show this off, I'm going to do one of the riskiest things to do in any demo. I'm going to code live. So we have our QSort.c file. Let's go to the top of the file. In order to use the Silk Scale API, first thing we need to do is include the relevant header file, which is silk slash silk scale dot h. And we just put that among the other includes. And now let's go to the region that we care about. The Silk Scale API, as mentioned earlier, is patterned off of uh, pretty familiar. It's, you can think of it as patterned off of get time of day. If I were writing ordinary serial code and I just wanted to time an individual region of that code, let's say a single function, what I typically do is say, well, let me uh, call get time of day before the function runs, then call get time of day after the function runs, um, and then take those two outputs and compute the difference. And then I'll output that difference. And that tells me how long did it take for just this function to run, right? Well, with the Silk Scale API, you can do pretty much the same thing. The data structures are a little different and the functions are a little different. Here's what they look like. So we're gonna want our start and end variables. Uh, the relevant data type is a WSP underscore T. Uh, I think the inspiration for this was work span probe. Um, sometimes I call them WISPs just for fun, but in any case. Um, so we're gonna create two of these variables. We'll name them start and end. Uh, and we'll say, before the function runs, let's just get the work and span of our computation. Then after the function runs, we're gonna say end equals WSP get work span. Great, so now we've, we've got a start and we've got an end. Now we just wanna output the result for this. I'll put it near the end of the end of the execution after all the sorting succeeds. Um, and just to output the result, we're gonna call WSP dump. And since it's a C code, we're gonna write WSP sub and we're taking end minus start. And for our own sanity, we're just gonna tag this output in the CSV file with a name. This name is just for uh, the programmer programmer benefit. Um, Silk scale doesn't do really any logic on the names. It just uh, uses that name as a tag in the CSV output and in the visualization. Um, so we can pretty much name it whatever we want. And so that's that. We add the header file. We have WSPT start and end, get work span, get work span, and then dump the difference in those two probes. Make sense? All right, so now let's go ahead and run this code um, using silk scale. And all we've done is modify the code. Well, we don't, have, we don't have to modify anything about how we actually build it. So we're just once again going to invoke Clang with f open silk, f silk tool equals silk scale and whatever optimization flag we want. We just recompile. And now when we rerun our QSort code, once again, we get the normal output of quicksort. We dumped everything to the CSV file. And if we just take a look at what's in there, we now have the same header as before with tag, work, span, parallelism, et cetera. Uh, we have a new line in the CSV file, which is tagged sample QSort. That's the tag that we used before with WSP dump. And this contains work, span, and parallelism measurements just for what we probed. And then we still have the work span and parallelism measurements for the overall execution as well. And so we just get all of that in the CSV file uh, as separate lines for each of the calls to WSP dump. And that's that. Okay, so that's cool, but you know, earlier, Alex mentioned that there were some pretty pictures that you could get out of silk scale. So let's see how we get those pretty pictures. Um, to get the pretty pictures, you want to get the silk scale visualizer tool. 
And that's currently available in a separate repository in the OpenSilk GitHub organization. So let's go and download uh, uh, download the productivity tools repository. And I'm just going to put this in the same directory uh, where I, uh, as a subdirectory of where I checked out tutorial. So I clone that. And I see, yep, I've got productivity tools there. Now let's go back to the compute node so we can do some interesting things with these productivity tools. Uh, this is a Python 3 program. Uh, it uses matplotlib uh, in order to do the plotting. If you don't have matplotlib installed, it will still run. Uh, it'll still run everything, and it will still um, generate the CSV file. But you'll also get some warnings that it can't generate the plot because you don't have matplotlib. Uh, nevertheless, you get a CSV file, and if you have a favorite spreadsheet program, you can go ahead and use that. Okay, so we have our um, we have our visualizer. Now, before we invoke the visualizer, we're going to... TB. Yes. Sorry to interrupt. We have one question on, on Slack. You. Oh, I see. Can OpenSilk help to initialize, say, a vector of objects in parallel by calling the constructor for each object? Place back or push back or something to the nature. Notice you use malloc inside of array A, which is sequential. Um, so malloc is constant time. Well, depends on your memory allocator, but typically it's constant time. Um, the mem copy is currently a serial. It's the default uh, mem copy implementation um, that we have in the standard library. If you choose to implement a parallel mem copy, you're certainly welcome to do so. Um, so, you know, for initializing arrays or vectors or that sort of thing, uh, you can do that in parallel, but uh, there are certain operations that will be uh, that will be serial in nature. Um, it very much comes down to uh, standard parallel programming uh, as things currently stand. Um, uh, looking forward, I think we want to with OpenSilk. Uh, one of the things of interest is to expand the set of parallel libraries that we make available. And so, if we've got fast silk parallelized implementations of certain data structures or common routines, then you could uh, just use those and get a parallel speed up from those, uh, from those methods as well. Um, but right now that, uh, right now, uh, it's basically up to the programmer to implement, you know, parallel constructors or parallel initialization. Uh, hopefully that answers your question. Ah, regarding the quicksort example, uh, you got 10 plus parallelism from silk scale on your two core machine. Uh, yes, and in fact, um, so this comes down to what exactly is parallelism. Parallelism, you can think of as in a couple of different ways, but one way to think about it is that parallelism is a measure uh, of what's the maximum possible speed up you could get with parallel processors uh, for this program on any parallel machine. Uh, and so one of the cool things with silk scale is that we can actually analyze the execution of a silk program and measure the parallelism and use that measurement uh, in order to, uh, in order to uh, predict how much speed up would I get from running this program on a yet bigger machine. Um, and I don't necessarily need the bigger machine at my disposal. Uh, so it means that I can run stuff locally on my laptop, which has a tiny number of cores, and still get uh, some insight into uh, how things uh, should perform if I were to run it on a large supercomputing node. And it looks like Angelina is uh, chiming in on that question. And so I'll let her chime in uh, while let's, well, let's make some pretty, pretty looking plots. Um, okay, so where were we? We downloaded the visualizer. Uh, before we use the visualizer, we're going to want to compile, make sure to compile the code uh, twice to produce two different binaries. So the first binary is just what we compile using fsilk tool equals silk scale. 
the second binary we get, uh, well, the second binary, we're going to be sure to read to name it something else. And in this case, we're going to use a slightly different compiler flag. We're going to say dash f silk tool equals silk scale dash benchmark. And this is a binary that we're going to use that the visualizer is going to use to perform some benchmarking. So once we've compiled our program twice, let's just go ahead and run the visualizer. Productivity tools, silk scale viz. Uh, we have a few Python files in here. Um, and all we're going to do is say Python 3, silk scale .py. I When I don't have the slides open, I usually forget what are all the options. And so I do this first, silk scale .py -h. This gives me some output telling me what are all the options I can pass to this tool. For our purposes, we don't need to use everything. But what we do need to use is say, well, the silk scale compiled binary uh, dash c. Uh, I'm going to point that at the binary I compiled using dash f silk tool equals silk scale. For dash b, this is the binary that I compiled using silk scale dash benchmark. And for convenience, I named it almost the same thing, but I appended dash bench to it. And now we can uh, specify a number of arguments. Let's give it a big output. Um, the rplot command basically says, uh, these are the lines of the CSV file that you should, you should plot in the pretty uh, performance plot. Um, it may collect additional lines, but only worry about plotting these lines. And dash rplot zero is a special number uh, to say, also plot the very last line of the CSV file, which contains the aggregate the, or the work span and parallelism measurements for the overall execution of the program. So we're going to get, uh, in our case, our CSV file had two lines. And so we're going to get uh, one line, which is just the region we measured, as well as a second line describing the overall execution. And so we're just going to run that. First, we get a run that uh, gives us the normal looking output. So we have some confidence that this is doing the right thing. And by default, it's just going to crank through what's essentially the count of number of hardware cores on the system, running QSort bench once per each core. So that's what we saw fill up the screen. And then by default, this produces a plot. Uh, it produces a plot in a PDF called plot.pdf. You can change that output uh, with another option to silkscale.py. Silkscale.py. For our purposes, uh, let's just go ahead and grab that. I have to SCP it back over to my local machine so I can show the PDF output. And there we go. Yep, so what we see here is uh, the first, we have four plots in total. Uh, each row of plots corresponds to a row of our CSV file. Um, the top row corresponds to the region that we measured. And we can kind of see that because the title of those plots has the tag we used. Uh, well, it's in the title. Um, and because we asked to plot the last row using our plot zero, uh, we also get the overall execution time plotted uh, in the bottom row. Um, execution time and speed up. On the left, we've got execution time plots. On the right, we have the speed up plots. And uh, these are the plots that you saw before when uh, Alexandros was describing the silk scale uh, visualizer. Um, so hopefully, if you have things set up on your system, you should be able to run this and uh, get some pretty pictures. Make sense? Any questions about that? So those were the hands-on steps. Uh, we saw, we've seen, you know, the basics of compiling a Silk program with, with OpenSilk uh, using Clang and the F OpenSilk flag. We saw, we've seen how to use the race detector, um, different optimization levels using uh, debug symbols or not, and then how to use Silk scale 
to get a CSV of your workspan parallelism, or how do you do benchmarking of your program and generate a nice plot. Um, one thing I want to show off, just because we have a little bit of extra time, I was playing around with some of these tools uh, the other day and managed to do something that I think is kind of neat uh, using these tools. So I just wanted to share that with you uh, with the time I've got. So in particular, let's clear the let's clear this thing. Uh, so in particular, I got a checkout of Ligra. This is the lightweight graph processing framework uh, developed by uh, Julian Shun and, uh, and others. Uh, and I wanted to see, well, uh, can I compile this with uh, FOpenSilk? And can I you know, use some of, the, some of the cool tools with Ligra? And so what did I do? Well, I cracked open Ligra and I needed to modify some of the make files in order to get things to work. Um, let me just hop over to that directory. So in particular, inside of Ligra apps, because I was just going to compile a simple, I think it was just breadth first search with Ligra. Uh, I went into the make file, and in place of uh, these lines where it's using G++ and fsilk plus and lsilk RTS, I just changed it to use Clang++, which is our C++ compiler, and then use dash F open silk, both for compiling and linking. And so with that, make, with that single make file tweak, I can now just run, um, let me make sure everything is clean. If I run make BFS and make sure silk is set to one, so it's going to compile the silk version, it's just going to use open silk to compile Ligra, or the BFS implementation of Ligra inside of apps. Uh, it turns out that Ligra makes pretty significant use of C++ templates, uh, and I think that uh, that slows down the compilation. Ligra is also um, fairly big in terms of just the number of functions uh, that it has. So it took a little bit of time to run, um, but now that it's compiled, we can go ahead and run it. We have to specify an input file. Ahead of time, I actually generated some input files uh, using Ligra's graph generator, again, compiled with OpenSilk. And so we'll just point it at one of those, uh, one of those input files. I think this is a, this is probably a decent one. And so we run it, and this is what we get. Uh, and what this, uh, what this did is it performed breadth-first search on our input graph, and it ran that execution multiple times, and it reported three running times, uh, one for each of those executions. All right, that's pretty cool. Um, but then I thought to myself, well, okay, how exactly is it computing those running times? Because I've got this kind of nifty uh, performance benchmarking tool at my disposal in OpenSilk, and I'd kind of like to use it in order to analyze uh, what's going on inside of Ligra. And so I graphed around the code base a little bit. And I ultimately found that um, all of the timing code for Ligra all that logic is basically encapsulated in a single utility file called getTime.h. And in browsing this code, essentially what this utility file does is it, uh, it provides methods which wrap calls to get time of day. And it has some local variables in the structure in order to maintain an accumulation of the total time spent or just the measurement of the running time for the last uh, for the last execution and that sort of thing. But fundamentally, this timing file is just using calls to get time of day. And as I mentioned before, the SilkScale API is patterned off of calls to get time of day. You should be able to, if you're using get time of day to measure individual regions, well, you should be able to do something kind of similar using SilkScale. And so what I did, uh, which I just, I wrapped in these if defs just for my own convenience in terms of presentation. You don't have to do this on your own. Um, but what I did was I took this get time of, this get time .h file, and in a few places that seemed relevant, wherever there was something related to a get time of day call to measure, uh, to take a local measurement of time or to accumulate measurements of time, I made corresponding uh, WSP variables uh, for 
measuring the total or measuring the last or for storing the last measurement. And then throughout this code, when there was a call to get time, I added a call to get work span. I think I forgot to uncomment this line. Turns out this one doesn't actually run. Um, in any case. And so throughout this code, I've got some calls to accumulate stuff in these uh, in these work span probe variables um, using calls to this get work span API. And then at the very end, in the routine that actually prints out a timing measurement, I just added a call to a WSP dump. And for convenience, I'm just going to use the same string that that uh, reporting method took already took as input. So pretty much all I did was I found the timing code inside of Ligra, and I almost copy pasted it and then tweaked it in order to use uh, the silk scale API rather than just calls to get time. And so what's the consequence of that? Well, what that means is that I can take exactly the same command that I, that I ran to compile this Ligra breadth for search code before. And if I add the silk scale uh, command to that, as silk tool equals silk scale, that compiles BFS with the silk scale tool. Have to wait a little while, but that's okay. And now, if I didn't screw anything up, actually it's in my history. Yep. So now when I run BFS on the same input graph, I don't just get these running times, but I also get work span and parallelism measurements corresponding to those measured regions. And unfortunately, the CSV output is kind of mixed with all the other output of Ligra. But once again, I can just uh, send the CSV uh, somewhere else. So I just get the running times. And I can just cat the CSV file. And voila, I get. Uh, the CSV of all those times, or all the work span and parallelism measurements. Now, moreover, because I just used the silk scale API, I can compile the same code once again uh, to a different binary name. But I can use the silk scale benchmark tool, like so. So we're just changing it to BFS dash bench and have silk tool equals silk scale dash benchmark. Compile yet again. And now I'm going to hop over back to the visualizer. And I'm just going to cheat and use my history to look up the invocation of silkscale.py from before and just tweak this to instead point at my Ligra BFS compilation. So BFS is the one we compiled with silk. Uh, silk tool equals silk scale. PFS bench is the benchmarking implementation. Uh, and we want to pass an input graph. Oops. We don't want to wait forever. Um, and from the CSV file, we saw that we got four lines of output. So we're just going to say 0, 1, 2, 3 uh, as things to plot. And let me just send this plot to a different file name, oplot of bfs.pdf. And now we're just using silk scale to run our breadth for search code, run the, uh, run the Ligra breadth for search code, and do some benchmarking. This machine has a lot of cores, which is kind of nice for getting interesting data. It's also encouraging to see that 
Generally, the runs seem to go faster as you increase the number of cores. That's the kind of performance we want to see when we're dealing with parallel code. Lo and behold, we have our bfs.pdf file. Let me just copy that over to my local machine and show that to all of you. And there we go. Bigger. So this time we've got four lines of plots. Um, each one of those corresponds to one of the lines of output that we had from Liger from before. And we have execution times on the left and speed up times on the right. Um, turns out that the execution times get to be pretty small on high core counts, which means that the performance variability we see from this machine uh, produces some amount of noise in the plots. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, we're able to, uh, with relative ease, uh, take an existing fairly sophisticated Silk application written in C++ and get it to use the Silk Scale tool just using the API and running the visualizer tool at our disposal. I thought that was kind of neat. I thought that was one of the uh, uh, kind of a nice benefit of this flexible API we have for Silk Scale. Um, and I just wanted to show that off to, uh, to all of you. So would you tell us what these mean? You know, what did you learn from this? Uh, from these plots? Yes. So or my focus is, learn? sorry? What should we learn? What should we learn from this? So what we see from the plots, we have a 45 degree line uh, describing perfect linear speed up. We have a line describing the burden DAG bound. This is essentially uh, a lower bound for the execution of the Silk program if you just factor in overheads due to steals. Mm -hmm. um, we do have a span bound, but it turns out that the span bound is greater than 40, and so it doesn't appear on this particular plot. Um, and what we can see is that, at least with this particular BFS code, uh, Things are, things are pretty good for a while, uh, but then they actually fall off. And in general, whenever, whenever we get observed performance measurements uh, that actually fall below the burden DAG bound, that tends to suggest that there's some other uh, form of overhead uh, which is inhibiting further, uh, further parallel performance. Mm -hmm. um, now, I haven't done anything. Uh, this is just the default BFS code sitting in uh, Liger apps, um, and I haven't enabled any any special flags or anything to, uh, for example, uh, turn on some of the uh, sophisticated encoding decoding optimizations that uh, that I know Liger is capable of. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but in but uh, this lets me at least get a get an overall sense of what the performance of Liger looks like on this machine, and it indicates to me that uh, with this compilation of Ligra, at least, uh, there's some kind of, there's a, some other source of overhead which is inhibiting uh, more speed up on higher core counts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the yeah. paper on uh, Silk Scale uh, describes four basic problems with speed ups. Uh, uh, first is not enough parallelism. The second is scheduling overhead and the third is memory bandwidth problems, and the fourth is contention. And in this code, uh, since we're not getting close to linear speed up, and in fact, we're not even ma managing to get to the uh, burden span, we can eliminate those first two causes as being the dominant reason for the, we're getting. So it would seem to focus on memory bandwidth or contention as being the issue for why you don't get speed up uh, more speed up for large numbers of cores. So it's, this is a great tool for quickly allowing you to focus in on what it is. Now, we don't have a tool that directly will do things like memory bandwidth or contention, but those are really interesting. Uh, there are ways of diagnosing that kind of problem, um, but at least we can eliminate uh, parallelism and scheduling as the primary cost of the slowdown using uh, this tool. So it's a big help in uh, things. 
I want to just do a time check here, uh, TB, because uh, we have only about 20 minutes left. And yeah. I think we should make sure that people have a chance if they're trying to debug things to work with our able um, assistants uh, to uh, get things working on their own um, on their own platforms. Yeah, certainly. Uh, that's pretty much uh, what I had to show you uh, when it comes to uh, OpenSilk and the various tools available. Um, so essentially, that concludes the the hands-on part, aside from uh, trying this stuff out on your own and uh, let us know how it goes. If you have any questions, we're available to, uh, to lend you support. Um, yeah, so I think what we'll yeah. do is um, if, if people are uh, want to try some of this out, um, perhaps what we can do is have, um, uh, you know, if you run into problems, let's go back to the uh, gallery view. Let's stop the screen share, I think. Um, all the slides are available on the, um, uh, at, in, in the Slack channel. You can see the link and so forth. So you can, you can grab the slides. So anybody who wants to try it out now is welcome to do so. And if you're having any kinds of issues or whatever, uh, we have several people here who can do. Just raise your hand. And um, I think we can create breakout rooms for the people who are um, to, to go to with one of the um, uh, one of the people who can assist with our, our, our spawn helpers is what uh, <laughs> TV would like to call them. So um, I can hear the groans even can, though you're all muted. Right. Otherwise, uh, I'm perfectly happy to continue uh, discussion. Um, and, uh, you know, we can talk about things like uh, teaching materials and things of that nature, which we're developing. There are a bunch of things that are already available uh, because a lot of the stuff that works with Silk Plus works with uh, Open Silk, And so um, the, the big differences probably are um, the tools. Uh, one of the problems with the um, Intel tools is because they were based on the pin binary instrumentation technology, that was another whole system you needed to get working and install. And it was not something that Intel tended to keep up with its uh, latest processors. There always be a lag of like uh, six months or so before PIN did whatever the latest processor release was. And that meant any tools, if you want to use the latest processors, suddenly you couldn't use the tools. Uh, and with this, the, the tools are essentially packaged up, integrated there with the compiler. There's no additional installation that needs to go on. You just get the tools and um, there are a lot of other advantages. There are differences between the, you know, between those things. So in any case, uh, I'm happy to have discussion. And if anybody uh, would like to um, avail themselves of one of the um, uh, teachers that or brag that they actually got the, um, the tutorial code examples to work, that would be great too. Uh, you know, or, uh, you know, it can be done offline. Um, so, um, you know, as I say, anybody, if anybody wants to brag, that'd be great. Um, I have the Fibonacci and, and Queens examples working. Uh, who, uh, who, uh, okay, John Mellick. John Mellick, right. right. I okay. installed it on um, Ubuntu under VirtualBox. Yeah. And I broke my sword on the, the tools because I ran out of space in my VirtualBox before I could install the plotting library. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I'll get to that later. Um, so I had a question about the two binaries that you were compiling for SilkScale. What's the role of the two binaries? Is one to measure the burden DAG and then the other one is just to measure the performance? Uh, pretty much. So the, when you compile with F silk tool equals mm -hmm. silk scale, uh, that instruments the code in order to measure work span, parallelism, and the burden DAG. <coughs> um, when you compile with F silk tool equals silk scale benchmark, uh, that compiles it in a mode for benchmarking. Uh, intuitively, you can think of it as uh, taking all those calls to, you know, get work span and silently replacing those with actual get time of day calls. 
Um, we're actually a little more careful in the timers that we use and blah, blah, blah. But uh, that's, that's the spirit of what we, of what we have uh, or yeah, what it's so doing. And so it's, one is for measuring work span parallelism and the other is for uh, benchmarking. So yeah, those so are plotting the pink points on the graph then, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. so okay. one is basically giving you the, the, the lines on the graph and the other is giving you the points that are being plotted on the graph. So you wanna plot the points, not with the instrumented code, but rather with what your binary really did. But you need the, right. to run the dynamic instrumentation tool in order to uh, produce the lines so that you know what the speed up potential and burden span, et cetera, are. So that's why you need the two, uh, the two binaries. You can certainly produce the plots with only the speed ups, but without the other lines, or you can produce just the other lines without the benchmarking. But uh, that's kind of a combined package that gives you both of them on one chart. Um, and uh, the, the, the system actually is componentized so that the visualizer is separate. You can do these things separately. You can output it to your own thing to make your own, uh, you know, if you want to produce the, it in Excel rather than, um, rather than in, uh, uh, you know, using the plotting software that we have, uh, you can do that. Um, because it's componentized so you can get the pieces that you want. It's not just an integrated tool without it's right now, I guess it's in three components. Is that right? The, the, um, uh, silk scale is right now in three components, I think. Uh, so there's the, there's the compiler. Um, uh, there's, and then, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, uh, there's a compiler. There's the productivity tools, uh, repository, which has the actual Python scripts to do, to run the benchmarking and produce the plots. Yeah, so I was thinking the benchmarking, the analysis, and the plotting are all, are, those are the three things I'm thinking about that are actually independent and that you could plug together however you want. And, and so for the, uh, the instrumented program, you just do one serial run like you would previously with Silkview? That's correct. Mm -hmm. okay. Yep. Yep. Actually, Silk Scale, uh, so, right. Silk Scale runs in parallel when it's measuring work span and parallelism. Oh, okay. That's cool. Yeah. Okay. The race detector does not yet run in parallel. Mm -hmm. um, Do you have I a think plan for that? Yep. And I think that, for, oh, sorry. Do you have a plan for the race detector in parallel? The, I mean, the SP bags is sort of a serial data structure. Yeah, so um, there's a great piece of work uh, that uh, Angelina, uh, who, who's on that paper with you, Angelina? Uh, she chose to, uh, Jeremy Feynman, I think, um, of, of um, how to I'm do I'm sorry. It. I was answering questions on the open silk. I, I blinked. Okay. Could you? So I just, uh, you know, about the uh, parallel uh, race detection. Ah, uh, yes. We have a paper that, that is, um, and a um, uh, demonstration, uh, you know, a prototype uh, race detector that runs in parallel. And uh, who is on that paper with you? Uh, well, so for the fork joint parallelism part, it was Jeremy and Colonel and Robert Otterbeck, who yeah, was his Kornall PhD Fiber student. And, uh, yep. So anyway, we have um, plans, if we can, to, um, you know, incorporate that. Uh, uh, you know, that's part of the performance engineering that we need to do is like, hey, if the tool can run in parallel, let's make it run in parallel. And, and where did that paper appear, Angelina? Uh, that would be SPA 2016. Okay, thanks. And, um, uh, and as I say, you can dissect this yourself. The race, the, the scalability analyzer uses this uh, CSI um, API, uh, but the, um, and the race detector uh, does as well, but the race detector also has special stuff in the compiler to, um, 
to allow it to operate. But all of those things are accessible in open silk. There, there's nothing, you know, that those are open things. And I hope we'll get some really uh, good analytical tools and especially things that make it easy for um, undergraduates to uh, experiment with the technology and, and, and so forth. So, so um, does the race detector have support for any annotations in it? So I know the, the previous version that was in, uh, from Intel, you could essentially like, you know, wipe a region of memory and say, forget about the annotations here if you knew that, that things were race free. And then, um, and Valgrind supports, uh, or I should say Helgrind supports that happens before annotations. Is there support for anything like either of those? Um, for beta two, uh, I'd say for beta two, no. For beta three, um, almost certainly yes. <laughs> for either or both? Uh, it would be, so one, one of the things that we're, um, one of the, one of the simple things we can offer is an API to turn off and turn back on silk sand, uh, around regions of your code. Yes. Um, there are that, I think my plan is to include that in beta three, at least that in beta three. Um, further annotations, I think it depends on the annotation. Yeah, right now we, what we've released is kind of bare bones. Uh, mm -hmm. it's basically determinacy race detection. There's not, uh, sort of general stuff. And I think this is, uh, this stuff is, you know, is great, but frankly, the code is there and, um, you know, having a better race detector um that work would be would be great um and uh also having better uh ui for things like the race detector i think would be um would be helpful uh so i think all those things are things and what we want to hear is is from people like you as to what we should prioritize you know and if people have a graduate student or uh are um you know uh, otherwise available to work on some of these things. Uh, it would be, I think one of the things Vivek, uh, had gotten out of the, um, Vivek Sarkar had gotten out of the, uh, advisory board was the, um, suggestion that we, uh, produce a list of things that people could work on. Okay. Oh, that'd be great. Uh, whether they be small benchmarks or, uh, or tool enhancements or whatever that would be helpful to do. And um, uh, I think that's a really good idea because I think there's a lot of potential for this. They, we've really lowered the bar to make changes to a parallel system with open silk. Uh, mm -hmm. It is so much easier uh, to deal with Angelina's runtime system than it is to deal with um, the Silk runtime, the Silk Plus runtime system from Intel, for example, and the compiler based on LLVM. LLVM is already very accessible for people who want to do compilers, and we are exporting our instrumentation framework so that it makes it easy for people to build tools. And so the idea is lower the bar, make it easy for researchers to do their comp, you know their things, you know, we're going to componentize so you can plug in your own scheduler without having to necessarily understand all of the intricacies and data structures and rewrite the runtime system. Uh, that's not done yet, but that's there. So we would love to hear how to prioritize our own, um, uh, you know, hear from everybody how to prioritize these things, uh, you know, what your own opinions are. Uh, love to have you, you know, Give us a piece of your mind, if you will. Um, a penny for your thoughts, yeah. <laughs> well, we don't even have a penny to give for thoughts. We need to get free thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we're really yeah. um, you know, indebted to uh, the National Science Foundation for choosing us 
and for the Air Force as well for, uh, for understanding just how important this technology is uh, to the future because we're, you know, Moore's law is over. We're going to run out of computational ability for doing all the kinds of things that we want to do with, um, with artificial intelligence and machine learning and so forth. And it's going to be, you know, getting performance in every way possible uh, out of software is, uh, it's going to continue to be uh, important. And um, I'm pleased that there are, um, you know, we have organizations like uh, the NSF and the Air Force that recognize just how important that is and the, the necessity could, of, um, of providing that. And they have really been great so far, giving us a lot of leeway in uh, allowing us to, to structure this the way, the way we uh, see fit. And, uh, you know, for the benefit of um, particularly the, the OWL researchers, uh, we also want to serve eagles, but, um, but as I mentioned, the, uh, and, you know, and I think the best way of serving eagles is letting them have the owls research. But we also want to serve the owls, you know, mm -hmm. so that they can provide a better uh, platform. So we could, we could put up the acknowledgement slides for a moment. Sure. Um, while you do that, maybe I can ask one more question. We're going to have to wrap up here in just a couple minutes. So if people have, um, you know, people can contact us with that information. Contact at opensilk.org is a perfectly good way if you have trouble installing or whatever. And uh, we can try to handhold um, if, uh, if you're having uh, systems issues or what have you. Okay. Um, there we go. Support acknowledgement. So, um, yeah, let me not interrupt the discussion. But... Yeah, so, um, but well, I think we have to interrupt because uh, yep, uh, we're, we're out of time. Has, to, has to do her thing. And we want to give a couple minutes for people to, uh, who want to attend both tutorials too. So let me recommend uh, her uh, tutorial, um, which uh, I think is going to be really outstanding. I'm looking forward to it myself. And I'm glad we got to go first because now I can relax and enjoy hers. So any final comments? Otherwise, um, you know, uh, good luck. Let us know what you find. And um, I do think this is something that is, um, it's easy to teach. Uh, the notions of work and span uh, and that they're actually embodied in something. It's easy to get code up and running for students. Um, you know, they don't need a high level of sophistication. You can do it in C as opposed to C++ if uh, students, you know, are, um, uh, you know, are learning C at the same time. In my class, they basically learn C and Silk uh, in the same class. Uh, we originally had them learning C++ and, and Silk, and that turned out, did not work out so well, not because they didn't work well, the Silk part was fine, but the C++ was just way more than what people could take on in a, cl you know, in a class on uh, performance engineering. Any final comments, uh, TB, Angelina, organizers? I was just going to encourage everybody to uh, to express their gratitude. If we all clapped at once, it wouldn't work, but we can all thumbs up <laughs> as a way of saying thank you. So uh, I, I think we're all very grateful for this fantastic tutorial and, uh, and a special thanks to this huge team of people you had here to help out. So, uh, so if we could all, uh, rather than clap, just give a little thumbs up here as a way of saying thank you.